you know, while we were putting together this workshop today, um, we kind of realized that both of these areas are quite, or not often talked about, they kind of get mixed in with other, um, with other topics, um, because there is overlap, which we will talk about later. But um, yeah, we just, we really found it quite interesting to, to just solely focus on pricing and sales. So it's uh, quite nice. Um, right, so today, first of all, welcome sunshine um obviously we're always glad to have you here and have you with us um for those of you who don't know us just very quickly this is the essex startups team um i think we missed off lauren actually i'm very sorry lauren <laughs> this is a very old slide um she is on here <laughs> she's even part of this so she's live here with us today so <laughs> We'll just sneak her into the slide later on. <laughs> Very sorry. Um, so we have uh, Andy Mew, who's our head of startup, and we have Alexa and Lauren, who are both our enterprise um, enterprise officers, and then we have Christian, our enterprise assistant, um, and then we have James and myself, who are enterprise entrepreneurs in residence. And um, yeah, I will update the slide later. I'm very sorry. This is <laughs> totally on my my behalf. Um, we want you to get involved today as well. So obviously there will be times where we talk a lot, but please do interrupt um, or like raise your hand or um, put something in the chat if you have a question. Um, please turn on uh, your camera if you can. It's just nice to see faces rather than talking to blank screens or um, images. But yeah, feel free to use your mic um, or the chat if you want to kind of ask questions, participate, engage. Um, this is a lot of content. There's quite a dense content I think we, we will cover. Um, so it's always, you know, if you don't understand something um, or could you please repeat this, you know, please, please make sure that you uh, engage and let us know. Um, and yeah, ask any questions away. But obviously we will have quite Q and A's in between. We have two breakout sessions as well. Um, but still, please ask. Um, so today, like I said, is very packed. <laughs> the first almost three quarter of the day we talk about pricing because it's a big topic um, and there are lots and lots of things around involving around pricing. Um, but then in the in the later in the afternoon, we also obviously going to talk about sales and we're going to do two breakout sessions, one for the pricing and one for the sales. Right over to you, James. Okay. All right. Thanks it's very much. Um, welcome, everybody. So, um, uh, as Magda said, uh, I work alongside the Essex Startups team, um, and um, with Magda, and we're entrepreneurs in residence. And pricing for for me um, has been one of those um, areas of frustration and discovery for a lot of the time because when I was building my own business, it was very much involved in. Um, kind of finding out where the pricing levels existed, getting comfortable with um, pricing as a lever within the business, getting comfortable with the way that we talk about it and the way that we deliver it. And I think that um, the first thing that there's a quote that um, I quite love and it comes from Oscar Wilde and um, um, it basically says this is a cynic is a man who knows the price of everything but the value of nothing. And basically that um, it's a driving thing when it comes down to our business. It's not about price. It is about value. It's about giving our customers an understanding and um, an expectation of what it is. And we'll go on to discuss that once we, we do it. We'll, we'll look at some of the pricing myths that exist um, and some of the challenges that that brings in in terms of thinking. But it, it, is a, it is a contentious issue because when you're actually sitting in front of somebody and you're talking to them about the value that you're providing and you're presenting them with a price. And that price is, if you like, the exchange rate between your customer and the value that you're offering. And when you get a rejection, when you get somebody that says, no, that's too expensive, then what they're actually saying to you is pretty much along the lines of, you're not worth it. We, we don't see what you're offering as being value in comparison to what you think it is. And it's quite a grueling process for a lot of people. And you often get this idea of um, salespeople who are very sort of kind of price orientated, banding around different prices here, there and everywhere, and sort of kind of almost manipulating the customers into a, um, into a buying position. But actually, 
You know, it's it, it's more than that. It goes runs deeper than that. So I think that there is stuff there that um, definitely, from the point of view of understanding that relationship between value, perceived value, right, from the customer's perspective, and the price, which is ultimately just simply a metric um, that expresses, if you like, the exchange rate between the two. And getting familiar with, with that and understanding how we different we, we see it um, is one of those challenges within business. So what I wanted to do, what we did straight away for, the, for this is just, we did a kind of a brief, like literally five, six question quiz, just giving ourselves a little bit of time to think about this from the point of view, what, you know, how much would you be willing to pay for a particular service, a particular thing? And again, reflecting upon the, that, that side of it from the point of view of, you know, where we see the value. So grab a grab a pen, grab a pencil if you haven't got a, um, you know, bad of paper or whatever it is. Just do that. Just do it, just literally these six questions, and we'll just play this game and see where you are with all of these. Okay. So, everybody got a pen? Everybody got a pen? Yeah. Oh, well, okay. All good. Excellent. So the first one is. How much would you be willing to pay for this? Uh, a roadside vehicle breakdown cover. So there you go. So I want you to come up with three prices for those three different um, suppliers. What would you pay on a monthly basis, monthly for, for that for a peace of mind? Anybody want to hazard a guess with the AA? Forty nine ninety nine. Forty nine ninety nine. That's not a bad effort, really. Um, okay. Anybody else? I put the forty. You got the forty, yeah. All right. Anybody else? I said twenty, but I don't drive and I don't know anything about. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fair enough again you know that's uh, that's showing the relevance and the value to you okay for the aa it's actually for this premium service there it's 69 pound a month right so it's expensive and it's there in comparison so what would you pay for the equivalent service from joe's recovery shop whoever joe is 32 Okay, that's not bad effort, really. I mean, it could be anywhere, to be perfectly honest, with Joe's recovery shop. It depends a lot on what you would be making that judgment call about. So is Joe a national um, provider? Is he a local one? Is he just down the road and all the rest of it? And finally, there's this green flag element. So the green flag are just another organisation. Got an idea for them? Are they more expensive or less expensive? Uh, yeah, yeah. You're willing to pay a maximum 50, depending on the services, apart from the money around the app as well. Okay. All right. Well, the answer is 45 quid. So they're cheaper than the AA, right? And they're definitely um, on that sort of kind of side, again, from the point of view of offering a premium sort of kind of service. And they are a national carrier. Okay. So next question then, how much would you pay for this? Three course lunch for two, excluding drinks and service charge at the Shard in London at Vintage Inns, which are a kind of like a, a branded thing. And of course, this is all pre-COVID when we could all go out and actually drink and eat and uh, celebrate life outside and do all the rest of it. And Prezos. So how much would we pay for each of those? £200 for the Aqua Shard. £200 for the Aqua Shard. Okay. For, one night, for one evening, for like one night, one event. No, it's just one lunchtime. So keep it lunch. The evening could be could be expensive. So think of it as a uh, as their sort of kind of their introductory offer. What do you think they'll charge? Hundred quid, maybe. Hundred quid. Yeah, it's not a bad guess. Okay. I think it's more about like what would you think the shard versus the vintage was in versus the prezzo. So it's more like see them all in conjunction. 
if you were to have a three course lunch for two at any excluding drinks and service at any of these which one is the highest price value that you would think and which one is maybe the lowest any guess <laughs> Okay, 200, 150, and 50. Okay, well, I'm definitely going out with Krishna for lunch. So, um, so the answer is is actually the Akrashad is uh, their introductory offer is 76 quid for it, for that. Uh, vintage jeans, okay, about half the price is 36 pounds. And Prezos, believe it or not, it's only a 16 pound discount underneath the Akrashad. So basically, Prezos would be 60 pounds. The bottom line of that is, right, is that, again, as Magda was saying, it's that relevance of the value that you would see in, the, in terms of this. So thinking about what you would ultimately pay up. It makes almost, if you think about Prezzo being £60 and the Shard being 76 the Shard actually sounds pretty good value compared to what you would get at, at Prezzo's. Okay, next question, question three. Bit more contentious given the uh, the local uh, the the uh, the recent news in the press and all the rest of it, but a replica football shirt for 2021 for Liverpool home, Manchester United home, and Marseille away. What do you reckon you pay for those? Yeah, Not for yeah. Liverpool. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Nothing, uh, yeah, yeah, fine, yeah, absolutely. Probably paying nothing for it, so no value in it whatsoever. Would buy <laughs> uh, 30 quid for Man United, 30 quid for Man U. Um, about you probably get half the shirt for that. It's about really 60 for Man U. Official, official brand of some main, like some football team, usually around 60. Yeah, I think it's about 60 quid for Man U, it's actually 42 for Liverpool. So they're obviously uh, discounting the sales. And for Marseille, the away strip, um, £41. So I, th I kind of thought that was a that was a kind of, I guess if you love Marseille, that's probably not a bad thing to do. But again, going back to that question, you've got your, you know, clearly for some of us, Liverpool, we never bother with it, so it's worth nothing. If you're a Manchester United supporter, yeah, you probably pay. But I, I you know, again, would you pay £62.50 for a shirt? So it's all that it's a, it's putting it into context, this concept of price and value and the value in terms of the perception to it for ourselves. So the next question is this one. Pre-lockdown, again, West End theatres. Yeah, you need to start selling shirts, Karina, absolutely. Pre-lockdown was the um, price of a West End ticket for these, what would you pay to view from afar? So these are bargain basement tickets. For the Lion King, Mamma Mia, and the Tina Turner musical. Fifty quid for Lion King. Fifty quid for Lion King, spot on. Forty-five actually, but yeah, spot on. For Mamma Mia, what would you pay? Eighty. Is that for Mamma Mia? Or is that more forty, maybe? Uh, right, okay, 40. Um, uh, it's actually 18 quid for Mamma Mia. And for the Tina Turner one? <laughs> Nothing. No idea. 25? 12, 12 quid. <laughs> Bottom line, why would you think we pay 45 quid for a Lion King ticket? Mm -hmm. very, it's Bigger very famous. <laughs> it's a very famous, famous film and brand. brand. It's almost a brand. Yeah, it's because of where it is and what it is. It's the Disney brand, and it's that protectiveness within Disney that they that they will ultimately do. It's a big venue. It's obviously a big award-winning show and all the rest of it, and um, it's been running for many many years. Um, but so is it, you know, so sorry again, sorry, Green. More cast too, so you're paying for the people involved. Yeah. It? Yeah, there is that as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's a huge cast, isn't it? And it's a huge costume event and all the rest of it. So it's, again, looking at it from that point of view in terms of differentiation, what you'd pay for Lion King versus the Mamma Mia price and whether you would actually think about it in terms of value and what you would ultimately want to, um, you know, kind of pay up in that respect. But I think you're also paying for a lot of the brand within that, the Disney brand. Um, and that untouchable aspect within price, that value, that untouchable aspect within it, we'll touch on a little bit more um, about that, but that ultimately 
is a crucial part of the development of within the business that, or a business. Price loyalty, yeah. Um, people will pay more. I always think. I always think that if you think when everybody was talking about um, the high street around the country and everybody was saying things like, "Oh, what do we need to be doing with the high street?" But actually, the the, the most successful high streets in the world are probably Disney Disneyland Main Street. You know, Main Street. It's it's people pay many many hundreds of pounds to walk down that particular piece of real estate. So ultimately, you've got to kind of think of it from that point of view. How much would you, oh, you know, how much do you love that loyalty of the Disney brand? Okay, so final one. I think it's the final one. Um, this is a kind of an interesting sort of kind of one. What would you pay for a tube of Aquafresh, Oral-B, 3D white? And has anybody ever heard of Marvis? No, me neither, when I found it. <laughs> Give it, a, give it a go. What do you reckon you pay for a tube of Aquafresh? All these are Amazon prices, by the way, so don't rush off and find out. But there you go. Awkward. 89 pence. Somebody did rush off and find, would have a good look at that one. 89 pence for uh, Aquafresh, yeah. 80 pence on Amazon. What about Oral-B, 3D white? Is that around three pounds? Yeah, three or four quid. Yeah, not bad, two pound fifty. So it's not bad. And this lovely brand, Marvis. What do we reckon about that? Six. The whitening hint. Oh, whitening mint. <laughs> whitening mint. What do we think? Makes your mint white. Either. Okay. Yeah, not bad. Two Three quid. Pounds. What did you say, Magda? Sorry. No, I was just reading out the chat. Uh, yeah. Well, the, the actual the answer is eight pound twenty why you would pay eight pound 20 for a tube of toothpaste that's just because he's got a very pretty brand by the look of it and a very pretty kind of thing they all claim to do the same thing by the way clean your teeth and freshen your breath so you know but eight pound 20 for a tube of marvis <laughs> yeah you de you definitely want a whiter whiter smile with marvis okay so question then what do, what do you think we learned from those sorts of comparisons Um, I think there's definitely a perception and also after sales surveys, but also brand to a large extent as well. Yeah, I think brand has definitely got so much to do with with it. And, and that's, I think, somebody quite rightly said, brand protection. Um, part of that is keeping the price high for a lot of these organizations. Anything else do you think you, you got away from it? Uh, Suzanne is saying people would pay higher prices if they are unaware of the worth of things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So again, you know, we we have this perception that um, people are incredibly price sensitive, um, and you know, in evidence, people tend to either not to be, or if they are very price sensitive, it is only because um, observing prices is very very easy. So the thing that obviously that Amazon and a lot of the kind of platforms like that have, have done, particularly, I guess, when it comes down to the big e-commerce platforms is presenting price visibility and the same with all of the kind of the comparison sites and the like, and for a lot of the stuff, but they're always people are using different tactics and different ways of, um, you know, kind of creating a lead price, which is a lot cheaper and then taking them in and creating add-ons and extras. And all it's right. also, uh, Jacobo was just saying that obviously people are willing to do pay different prices for different things. And there are huge variances in that. And I think that's, um, it's very subjective to the different types of customers um, that each of the brand, because I'm, I, I assure you the Marvis customer is a different one than Aquafresh has. So, yeah. Uh, even though they're the same product, <laughs> more or less. Yeah. Customer. So. And I, th I think, I think what I found interesting about the Marvis one mm -hmm. on that one was why would they, you know, what was it that they were selling on Amazon? And therefore I think with, again, with all of these kind of like Amazon and thing, things like that, Amazon, Amazon is not appealing to the Marvis customer, but the Marvis customer is finding them on Amazon. So it's a different kind of frame. And in a way, when you're out there doing whatever it is that you're doing, whether you're, creating an app and you're wanting people to download it it's finding your right target market that's the most important part of that you know if, of being relevant to that particular audience so I want to kind of talk a little bit about some of the pricing myths that exist around um, various ways and, and 
there was a paper that I read when I was doing some research for this and when I was thinking about it and I'd read it before and so I came across it maybe a couple of years ago and um, it's about basically six myths of pricing and how we can um, display, if you like sort of kind of blow them up or you know certainly um, kind of disband them from that perspective. So these six pricing myths, which comes from this particular paper, it was written in 2016, um, and um, it's accessible, you know, kind of through Google Scholar or whatever, but but this is, this is the kind of the core element of it. So there are these six things. And the first myth that you're gonna find is that costs are, you know, the biggest driver of pricing. Whereas in fact, inevitably, um, Customers actually truly really don't really care about the costs of things. What they really want to care about is whether you're actually appealing to them at a particular level. So this whole idea of we become really, really transfixed by nailing our variable costs or our fixed costs. And I think it was Henry Ford that said there is no fixed cost. Um, primarily what there is is a price that we will sell our car at. And what we end up doing is driving the costs down associated or up or whatever within that at, to meet the, the value that we're offering our particular clients. So Nike is sort of kind of one of those companies that um, for a long time was basing its pricing on cost based pricing. Um, and then they um, literally about I think it was in 2010, they changed their model to a value based um, uh, pricing model. And um, they, their profits and their whole kind of sales aspect increased phenomenally because, as was said earlier by everybody, the brand became um, more alive. The brand became more exclusive in a lot of respects. And people um, really did go after, um, after that kind of perception of value. They were still selling the same kind of clobber and the same shoes and everything else like that that in terms of their manufacturing and their costs, it was all very much the same, but they recognized that there was something more exclusive about their brand that allowed people to pay for a higher price and costs therefore, they're not ignored and they're really important when we come to consider how we build, um, how we test and validate the stuff that we're doing. But at, but at that particular point, costs are not the consideration when it comes to actually driving a selling price. What we're aiming to do is drive that price to where the customer sees real value. So value-based based pricing um, is really, if you like, the only pricing approach that, that is linked, directly linked to the profitability of a business. The more value that is perceived to be there, the higher the price that people will pay, and ultimately the profitability of that business will, um, will grow. So it's a really crucial kind of um, mindset to get into and it, it, one of the challenges I think we'll again we'll go back to to this as we sort of kind of work through the, these myths one of the things that we've got to get our heads around is is that um, if customers under if it's the right customer and they see the value in what we're doing price becomes a vastly less important indicator of activity price just doesn't appear in that kind of mindset so from that point of view, Everything that we're doing is driving price at that, at that level. Okay, so the next myth that uh, went on is that a small change in price has little impact. Well, actually, a small change in price has a huge impact versus, say, for instance, a small change in the variable costs of a, of a product or a small change in a fixed costs of a product and, or even a, you know, an increase in the sales volume of that Product and that little table over there shows the significance of a small change in, in selling price that it can have upon right the overall profitability. And there's been a lot of work done on this. There's been a lot of kind of evidence, and there's an empirical research. And and it just within the organisation, it's just about getting the the the, the minuscule bits right and improving on various things within the pricing and you can really drive profitability. But price increases or price changes like that in isolation, and they may have limited impact, but if you've got that, and if you're doing that, and if you're obviously growing prices based on inflation or other aspects, you might have to, you've got to be thinking about, again, the growth in, in the value that you're trying to offer from those in that particular thing. But changing prices tends to have 
very little price impact about the elasticity. So what about price change in proportion to the total EG Fredo temporary increase caused outrage? Again, if Fredo went out and increased its price by 10p with no explanation, no increase in value, no perception that they were doing anything different. So in other words, if they'd have increased the price 10p but changed the, the contents to be organic or if they'd have gone out and supported some aspect of their um, within their model, then that may well, at the end of the day, have shifted some of the outrage. Or if they'd have moved their model to somewhere different in terms of their customer segment that they were aiming at, if they'd have changed some aspect or a dynamic of it, would, rather than just stick Tempe on the price, then some of that outrage may be tempered. But again, you know, a Tempe increase on price for a product which is probably worth, I don't know, a 10% increase, yes, you've got to make sure that at the end of the day, that you are justifying this. And one of the things that I always say to businesses now when I go out and meet them is today is a very different world to what it was 18 months ago, okay? So 18 months ago, we could probably get by on a shoestring of reserves and, and the like because we were, um, service was uninterrupted. Things were, were less volatile. There wasn't a... Um, there wasn't a dynamic um, shift in the supply chain. There wasn't all of the stuff that we've had from the pandemic. What we've got to do is we've got to change our mindset. It means that prices will have to rise. And I think I firmly believe that. And I think you're already seeing it to a degree in the hospitality industry. And I was watching a program this morning about how hard it's been for a lot of them from the outside serving drinks outside due to the weather and the like, but they are having to make really sort of drastic decisions around what they're doing. And at that particular point, what we're saying to them is, is okay, fine. You know, you've got to build in reserves into your pricing models. You've got to be able to um, create, um, you know, a reserve within what you're doing because you've got to be able to survive. And there's no point being there for the short term. You've got to be there for the long term. Okay, so another myth that gets there is that customers are indeed highly price sensitive. And as we can see, there are literally different um, prices for all of the relevant, the, pretty much the same thing, a burger. So the gourmet burger may have better quality buns, better quality uh, meat or better quality cheese. But at the end of the day, it's got a price which is a hell of a lot bigger than all of those other ones. So, you know, you've got to kind of, in terms of the perception from the point of view of the customer, Customers, again, will see different value in each of those. So if you look at, say, for instance, the Big Mac, I think that retails at about £3.30, £3.29. The Whopper, something around £4.79. And the Mighty, which is out there, that basically retails at £12.95 for a burger. At the end of the day, it's a burger, right? But the customer segment is the important thing. They are appealing to different marketplaces. Sure, Big Mac and Whopper are probably appealing to a similar market segment, but there is something still about a perception of difference between the two. So clearly Gourmet Burger are appealing to another customer segment, but within that, um, customers are quite willing to change. They are quite willing to, um, to ignore the kind of the price sensitivities as much as they can. Uh, so again, thinking about this in terms of your own delivery and your own product, think about how if, they're pre if people aren't that price sensitive, where can you embed a higher level of margin within what you're doing? How can you embed a higher price into that particular process in order that you can actually show and increase the level of value? Uh, you're gonna have to click that slide three times, Magra, I think, because it's got three bits of animation. There it is, and you can go on to the next one. So myth number four, products are different, difficult to differentiate. It's not true. Um, you can take even, um, so there's a quote there from a, another paper, Pine and Gilmore, which says, even the most mundane transactions can be turned into memorable experiences. So a tin of beans is just a tin of beans, unless you attach something to it. And in this particular example, you could create a bean club, you could grow your own beans, you could join an allotment community, you could do all of those different things through the bean club. Right. The bottom line of it is you're creating an experience. So even commodities can be can be differentiated through experience. And if you're creating that experience, then ultimately you're potentially able to charge a higher price for that particular process. It could well be that your beans are organic beans as opposed to non-organic beans or something along those lines. But again, 
right? It's finding a method to create some differentiation, to create some value. And at that particular point, to be able to actually move your pricing to a higher level. One of the challenges for a lot of people within business is they always start to think to themselves, the only way that we can compete is at price. And the bottom line there is, is that, you know, competing at price is, the, is if you like, um, stepping on a negative cycle to the lowest common denominator. You will go bust before the next person. All right. So if you're going to take on Heinz, you need to have pretty deep pockets to be able to take Heinz on at the price level. You can take Heinz on by being different. Um, by, by creating some form of differentiation in what you do and making it really impactful at that point. Okay, so the last one I think in this, Lord, the, the fifth one is basically uh, high market share equals high profits. Um, I found out pretty early on in my kind of career that if you actually go after big market share on it, on a lot of stuff, you're always going to be actually on comparison. You're going to be very much on show. And it is hard at that particular point not to be compared on price. And it is hard to, at the high levels of market activity, not to be sort of kind of to differentiate yourself. But there is this area at the sides there of a bell curve, which is called, if you like, the um, ketosis or something along those statistical sides, but it's basically the fat tails. And that way you've got not necessarily a huge market size, but you've got right the ability to be able to actually be substantial within a niche. And if you focus on that area, then at that particular point, first and foremost, competition is limited and lower. Second, more value is created because you're dealing with um, a select number of customers. So one of, the, one of the programs when I first started out, I started to work in travel and tourism. And one of the, pro, the first programs I ever developed was a, um, was a very independent traveler um, brochure for a large tour operator. And the, um, the beauty of it was that we were only ever selling um, very, very exclusive um, properties within, um, within the framework. And it just meant that there was limited supply um, these holidays were not for everybody, but the price was generally um, higher and the margins were much wider. So we actually created a very high value niche to operate in. And we kind of, that kind of stuff went, has now become more and more common. So you've got a lot more of that kind of process, but finding some part of your market space where you can operate and become even more um, valuable to a select client base is a really good place to actually earn decent margin. So actually you then become the dominant force. You become the leader in that part of that curve. And it's at that point that you can start to actually generate um, some decent profit. And you, there are multiple niches within any market space that you can, um, you can pick up and you can move or, you know, move on. Okay. So myth number six, uh, is this and it's basically that managing prices just means by changing prices and it isn't the case we can manage prices in lots of different ways we can manage prices by bringing in different processes and systems into our um, business that ultimately changes if you like the value situation between ourselves and our customers if we can think about that customer from the point of view of that value exchange then ultimately um, prices um, can be managed in regard to expectation and perception. So it doesn't have to mean that we've got to go to go and raise prices or lower prices on a, um, you know, on a in a particular way. But we can ultimately manage the price and the perception through changing different facets of the business. So again, it's about being agile. It's about being thinking about what we're doing within the business and thinking about different um, mechanisms, if you like, different pricing strategies that can help us through you know, this process. One of, the, one of the things that I find quite amazing is when I, again, when you talk to businesses is how little people will respond to pricing, how much it becomes a contentious issue. Um, people would much rather do different things than focus in on what that price is because it's quite a personal, exchange is quite a personal um, comment. And even if you've got 
um, you know, if you're consulting and if you're sitting there within, you know, a consulting environment, one of the hardest things to do is to actually um, create a price for your own time. But it, that's what you've got to do. You've got to value what you're bringing to, um, to the business, what you're bringing to yourself. So you've got to ultimately be, be happy and confident um, about your net, your worth and what you're doing within your, within the business. So again, it's a kind of elevating yourself. And I think in any startup business, it doesn't matter what startup business you, you're looking at, probably the most important part of the, the brand is your own personal brand, is your own personal credibility. So focus on building that. And that at the end of the day will give you the ability to be able to actually think about charging and moving your prices higher. Okay, all right, so it's gonna finally go on. Any questions at this particular point? Any thoughts, observations? When, when, we, when you were discussing about the, the myth, myth five, when you said about regarding the price share, and you said like, if you have a huge market share, you tend, you, you, don't, you don't always um, have a greater revenue. Is that, is that the concept of economy of scale? When you get so big, is the, you increase also your cost of managing the man, managing your business and also yeah. the, having different, you are more inefficient to control your different department and different location. I, different... I think it's just, it's a it's a perception, isn't it? There's a, there's a lot of perception. If you own the, the dominant space that you will ultimately um, be the wealthiest of everybody out there. But actually, um, if you take an example, right, of a, a large car manufacturer, somebody like, I don't know, Ford or whatever, they're not the most profitable car manufacturer out there by any stretch of the imagination. Some of the smaller car manufacturers on a unit basis make more, vastly more money than, say, Ford, Ford does. But the bottom line of this is, is that, that it's, again, if you go for market share, um, the economies of scale, by all means, yes, you can you can get that from that particular part. So you control your supply chain. You control. You might have an integrated supply chain. So you may you may actually have manufact you know control of your um, you know the the production side of it as much as the the retail side of it. But the bottom line of it is you. It's kind of a place where you're constantly looking for efficiencies. You're constantly looking to find. Um, cost savings because your price is always vulnerable to the next person that's coming along um, and that means that you're potentially units you're shifting lots and lots of units but maybe your margins are getting squeezed all we're saying here is is that you don't have to go for market share you can operate at the niche and make a decent living at the back of it you can actually earn good money by operating at that part of the the fat tails of the bell curve. And I think that, that we avoid stuff like that a lot of the time. So again, when you're, if you're, I don't know what your business is, but let's just say, for instance, it's a piece of technology, an app or something like that. At the end of the day, there are, there are millions and millions and millions of apps that are sitting around and not getting downloaded, not getting used, not getting utilized, not getting found, not getting all of those different things. And I would suggest that a large proportion of them haven't yet nailed where their market really is and where they're operating. So actually um, being really clear on that market and the customer um, is a really crucial part. And again, being very relevant to those um, to that person or those people uh, means that when you are communicating to them through your marketing and through your your um, your brand and whatever, you're becoming highly relevant. So going back to that tube of toothpaste, right? The bottom line of it is, is that final tube of toothpaste had a very specific client base and was appealing to that very, very specific client base and was managing to charge eight pound or 12 pound, whatever it was for that tube of tooth toothpaste versus the others, even though it was doing exactly the same because it appealed to that particular client. So yeah, definitely from the point of view of high market share does not always equal high profit. Okay, any other questions, thoughts? Good. All right, okay, so I just want to touch on pricing strategies because um, inevitably when we're thinking about, again, 
pricing pricing strategies. Most people have a kind of like a one a one size fits all pricing strategy, which is they discount or they do something along those lines to actually drive prices or drive um, sales or or whatever. So they kind of come out with um, you know one maybe one or two different strategies. But actually, innovation within pricing is a relatively underutilized mechanism for making ourselves um, more efficient, better um, customer service um, and the like. And that statistic there, I think just about sums up that if you know, and it's a, it's a new, it's a relevant, relatively new certificate or um, statistic, which basically, you know, from 2014 came from that or from a paper that uh, exists around that. But that pretty much tells me that if you're gonna look at pricing, right? as a mechanism to create competitive advantage, you are gonna be doing it when a lot of other people don't even bother to think about it. They just deliver the one price fits all, the cost plus price. So basically um, most people in the kind of the world of sales and the way even on the boardrooms or even the startups, they always see pricing as, a, as that kind of win-lose situation, that win-lose relationship. They always see, you know, if they manage to charge a higher price, it means the clients and customers lost. Uh, if the uh, if the business has to lower its price, it means that the customer at the end of the day wins. So that kind of win lose environment um, that tends to chew an awful lot of goodwill up in that environment in that way. So there, are, so it's basically research that shows the companies that sort of kind of implement this um, an innovation um, process to this with a mindset of two things. One to grow profitability and the other to grow better relationships with your customers. And therefore you're actually thinking about it from a win-win perspective. Because if the customer is actually gonna get a better relationship and a better piece of delivery, and they're gonna pay a price which works for you in terms of raising your profitability, then everybody wins in that particular situation. And we lose this um, conflict, this potential conflict. So. That, so those two desired outcomes within there, you, you'll see that from the point of view of um, the pricing. So the two desired outcomes of innovative pricing um, exist. That's so next slide, Magda, sorry. Right, so growing that customer satisfaction, increasing our amount of cash that we have within our business, generating more profits ultimately suits us and it will drive better loyalty at the end of the day within the customers. And it's that alignment of value between ourselves and what the customer is there, um, their expectations and bringing in different mechanisms to be able to do that. So one of the first ones, an example of this is um, Rolls-Royce. I don't know if you know this particular um, example. One of the, I think going back on probably about 10 years ago now, Rolls-Royce, obviously they power or they sell jet engines to the aircraft industry, but they were basically either leasing or selling these engines and then charging a fortune for um, service time. And of course the, the airliners were basically paying Rolls-Royce for the engine. And they were also paying largely for the servicing of the engine when it meant that the engine was out of operation and out of use, which meant that the customer or the airline was actually feeling marginally cheesed off, both from the point of view of um, the customer service and also the fact that um, from from that point of view then basically they were paying for when when their aircrafts were grounded so Rolls-Royce changed their model they changed it to power by the hour which meant that the only time that Rolls-Royce earned any money was actually when the engine was flying that was the difference and so at that particular point they charged an hourly rate for every hour that the engine was being used and from the customer's perspective, that was great because they were getting a, um, they were getting something from which was an understandable fixed price on their business or a variable price rather on their business. They could basically factor that nicely into anything that they were doing with regards to their, their airline. And it also meant that from their perspective, Rolls-Royce were incentivized to keep that business or that engine in the air safely and clearly. Um, but from that point of view, it was it ended up growing Rolls Royce's profitability quite significantly because it improved efficiencies in their servicing, 
Um, it meant from the customer's perspective that they gained a great deal of value from that. Um, they themselves were able to um, sell their aircraft seats to cover um, this. And at that point, we created the win-win situation. Um, that model was then adopted by a number of different um, uh, airline companies and um, engine companies. And I think that the, the ultimate thing there is, is that it's just reconfiguring the mindset from the provider to the customer. What works for the customer, right? And go and wearing that customer's hat. So the empathy that you can feel. So Rolls-Royce clearly uh, listened to their airline companies and then they decided, okay, what can we do to improve customer relations and increase profitability? So I wanted to kind of consider um, an environment, something that maybe we, you know, it's relevant to all of us. We all go shopping in supermarkets and thinking about it, but let's think about the supermarket of the future, the different supermarket um, that might be. And the reason um, I wanted to look at this was to how we could potentially think about some pricing strategies, innovative pricing strategies around this particular um, uh, this particular idea, this concept of a, of a supermarket of the future. So as we go through these, I'll just make a note of some of the strategies and whatever, because there's a case study that we put to you at the end of it, which will ask you to consider which kind of strategies you might consider for that particular case study. So here we have, we've got a, um, a supermarket of the future. It's an AI powered shopping bag. Basically, um, it's there, it's, um, you know, it's thinking about um, all of the various things that go into this particular shopping bag. Um, it's got a health score, it can tell people what they're doing, it knows what the, um, the objectives of the customer are. And basically, from the point of view of the shopper, right, it gives them a, you know, ultimately total control over um, what they're buying and what they're doing. So it's a kind of, from that point of view, um, some of the kind of the, 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 what stops us being innovative within our pricing is this clinging on to some of those kind of myths, those destructive myths that we've just talked about and, and coming to terms with sort of kind of the contentiousness over pricing in general and getting familiar and comfortable with um, the way that um, uh, we can you know, we can reconfigure the language around price and how we can make it uh, more aligned to our everyday life and what we're doing. So let's consider kind of seven strategies or actually there's a few more than that, 11 strategies of innovation that could be applied to each of these. And so the first one that we're going to look at is this idea of good, better, best customer segmentation. Spoken about it earlier on, and this is where one price at the end of the day, um, you know, one size fits all, it's kind of it's gone and we end up with um, different pricing structures. There's a way of talking about it, dynamic pricing, customer decides which one they see as offering the best and value for their particular needs. You've got a lot of services, you know, a lot, lot of um, software as a service that literally is priced on that particular model where you've got lots of different trajectory or tiers of pricing. Um, supermarkets generally, um, uh, use, you know, kind of multiple ways they've got themselves, you know, they've got the basic um, lines, they've got the, um, the branded lines, and then they potentially got the exclusive or, um, if you like, the taste the different line for a lot of their kind of food products and things like that. So they're already engaging with this good, better, best customer segmentation. I guess the issue for a lot of this is the customer still has to perceive what is value. They still have to um, consider whether you know paying that extra amount for the taste the difference product is actually worth it compared to say for instance the branded product um, and so the supermarket of the future may well start to um, reconfigure some of that understanding you may have a better idea about um, the contents of the uh, of the shopping bag they may have a better idea about the um, the value of the brand and what the brand stands for. And they may be able to make those judgment calls and change those things around that. So the supermarket if you could still differentiate between um, the products or whatever and the customer, but they can do that in a particular way, which um, is much more dynamic potentially. So 
going on from that good, better, best customer segmentation model, we've got the needs-based customer segmentation. And the needs-based customer segmentation is very much about um, taking the specific needs of your customer and ultimately looking at what they value, right? In terms of their goals and what they're about. So the customer themselves can drive these particular things. And so, so from that point of view, um, in the supermarket of the future, you've already preloaded, the, the customer is known um, more, if you like, um, you know, more than they are today. Um, they're very distinct, they're well-defined, they're, they're talked about in that. And if you think about the kind of technologies like um, artificial intelligence, the internet of things that would allow that depth of customer-based segmentation. So as you walk through that kind of supermarket environment, the supermarket almost knows before you've even walked through the door what type of customer you are, and they can direct you through that supermarket to what they believe you will be buying or want to buy. So again, it's that kind of connection between um, the needs base of the customer, i.e. being really clear on that and having multiple value propositions that suit each of those particular um, needs or those particular customer segments. Um, and it's really, you know, kind of, again, when we think about um, what a business might offer, right? A, if you take, for instance, a car dealership, nowadays, more and more car dealerships are becoming so highly segmented in what they offer from the low entry cost branded brand, you know, stuff. So if you take something like BMW, you've got your one series, you've got your electric vehicles, you've got all of these different customer segmentation that's going on and it's becoming hugely needs based. And again, as technology takes over, um, the chances are that those needs will become even more dynamic. So we're already at that particular point where you can almost design your own vehicle before you even go into a showroom. So what you expect when you go into a supermarket is almost just like a, a, an aisle that's already designed for you to be there. Um, another one that, uh, another innovation strategy that's, uh, that's around and people are doing it more and more is the pay performance for performance pricing. So this is where, I think this is probably one of the more interesting ones right? Instead of just shopping for kind of a particular family budget or whatever, you could actually in the future be starting to shop for particular um, goals. Like I want to lose weight. I want to lower my blood sugar levels. I want to, I want to feed my family on this particular budget. Um, my goal is to eat, you know, whatever sustainably. So you've got all of those different goals and ambition, but actually in order for you to achieve those goals, that's when the supermarket will start to charge you. So in other words, if you're losing weight for every pound that you lose, the supermarket at the end of the day will actually pick up some additional value. So there is a way of tying that. And again, the technology is almost there. You've got your Fitbit watches, you've got all of that Bluetooth connectivity, you've got the ability potentially to load up your goals at the beginning of a year around your, your foods and your, and your you know, clothing or whatever it is that you're doing. And at that particular point, there is a mechanism or a way to actually record the success or failure of those particular goals. So I suppose the closest outside of something like the supermarket stuff would be, um, say, for instance, in a crowdfunding business, whereby, um, you know, the crowdfunding platform only really gets paid if they actually succeed uh, in raising that amount of money for you. Um, if the campaign fails, then basically you walk away and they walk away, but they will get paid at that particular point if you succeed. So pay for performance is a really, it's a hard thing to manage now if the metrics aren't there, but in the future, you can imagine with AI and IoT that things will become that much more um, understandable, clearer and harder for people to game or to, to usurp or whatever. And goal oriented shopping could well be the future. IoT is Internet of Things. So that is the things like the Bluetooth connectivity. Um, and it's becoming more and more prevalent around it. So frigids that tell you when you're, you know, when you're, um, you know, you're running out of milk, things like that. They, these sorts of Internet of Things are becoming more and more prevalent in everything that we're doing. And technology, I would say, um, uh, you know, 
is really, really crucial in terms of, of in, around the pricing um, arena. Okay, so the next one I want to quick, quickly touch on is price to drive market expansion. And this is just really thinking about pricing as a strategy, right? In terms of that. So pricing in something along those lines where you've got the ability to be able to actually um, set a price to the market and you want to grow pricing on the back of that. Um, going forward again, one more. That's it. So I'm trying to write in the chat and it doesn't let me, my computer is. <laughs> so then price minus price. So basically that is setting out, setting a price to the market and then ultimately taking out your margin and then, then driving costs to match that petite piece of delivery. It's just a remodeling of the cost plus method, but it ultimately is a strategic way of growing your market expansion. It just, in all of this, it's about, you know, the questions about what you want to be doing within pricing is always about strategy. How do I in create the right strategy to deliver this? Um, and what do I need to be doing to make that strategy um, work? And so if you've got price, as a dynamic part of your conversation with your client, then you need to be able to actually utilize it in a way that can actually then achieve your strategic objectives. And in this particular case, you've just got it to drive market um, activity. So a good, good kind of um, example of that, IKEA are very good at this. They will basically build a piece of furniture um, and then they will ask themselves, well, what price can I sell that piece of furniture at? Where will my client see that as value? Um, and then once they've done that, they then take their kind of percent, their margin from it. And then they say, well, OK, that leaves us this amount of money to be able to actually make that piece of furniture. How can we actually do that? So it's but it's not all, always in the product space. It could well be in the service area and the like. Um, and then the supermarket of the future, it could well be that, um, you know, the, the prices are determined um, by other factors than just simply, you know, the costs or whatever. And there's already an element of that clearly that goes on within the supermarket framework. They have dynamic pricing models around their kind of around all their food offerings, around clothing, around whatever, they just simply to drive you into that particular thing. And there's always that competitive element on that. But again, um, there's an element of, you know, where technologies could really sort of kind of improve a lot of that. And you could end up with um, circular uh, models in terms of that by a mean whereby we're, we're talking about circularity, where the inputs and outputs of different um, products or different uh, packaging or costs or whatever could be utilized or reutilized that can actually then lower or improve the price. So there's, there, there is a, there, this area where we're countering the kind of um, the idea that price is a fixed element and that price is actually quite a dynamic part of the business. Okay, so zero is a special price. We talk about freemium models. Freemium is a mix of free and premium. It's giving away something that we're really, really kind of good at. So for instance, in the world of Google, um, they gave away search um, and then they really earned their money through advertising, pay-per-click marketing, um, various search engine, stuff like that. But the actual search itself, the browser, things like that, that's really what Google was all founded on. And it's the real, if you like, the value proposition that they have, but they give that away for free. So from that point of view, zero is a special price. Not pay-per-click marketing, sorry, pay-per-click marketing. So pay-per-click marketing is um, a very- I love pay-per-click though. I love yeah, like pay-per-click pay marketing. Pay -click marketing. That was a good, good yeah. name. <laughs> so pay-per-click it, it's abbreviated to PPC and it basically is um, a, you pay for a word on Google. AdWords. AdWords, yeah. So you pay for a particular word. So if you are running a, let's just say you're selling fried rice on, on the internet and you basically have a word which is fried rice and you would go onto Google and every time somebody Googled the word fried rice, your advert, your website would appear in the search. So when you've gone Google, you've got that bit at the top, the first three or four names and you've got adverts 
for each of those. And they're basically paying Google to get onto the search page. All right, so that's pay-per-click marketing. But you can, from the point of view of zero as a special price, I mean, you've got that in terms of Google, you've got it in terms of Skype, another one that um, uh, very much sort of kind of gave away its free call service for the internet, but it charges for fixed landlines. All right, so it charges for fixed line um, use. Loads of different ways of doing it, loads of different ways of, of bringing people into your business. Um, and thinking about it from the point of view of where you're offering value and how you're, how you can do that. So in the shopping market of the future, you could probably give away the, your AI free shopping bag. So your artificial intelligence shopping bag, and um, you could charge them for a personalized shopping service, something along those lines. It's a mechanism, but it's a price in its own right. Next one along the line, contingency pricing, or sorry, is it? No, participative pricing, I beg your pardon. So participated pricing, all right, this is um, basically two things there. Uh, one of which is you've got name your price. So this is a, if you like, no more than if you a kind of auction in that respect. Um, uh, so you, you set a price, the, the seller sets a low threshold. eBay is a prime example of this. And you go in and you name a price and you either get, get it and the buyer or the seller rather says, yep, that's fine, I'll do that. It's above my threshold, so we'll buy it. Um, the other one is pay what you want. Um, yeah, exactly, like eBay for that one is exactly that. So you, you're, create, you're creating an auction to be able to do that. The other one is pay what you want. Um, and this is sort of kind of, um, the customer can pay you know, the price that they want and they could even pay zero um, for that particular price. And the bottom line of this is, is it may sound intuitively suicidal from a business perspective, but you'd be amazed that people will pay um, for that. They won't do just take the free. Um, yeah, the initial price could just simply be your costs and that could be the where you want it to be for the name your own price as a threshold in this one it's a slightly different mindset because actually the customer um, does pay up for something because of social norms and because they do not want to see um, themselves either um, driving the business into bankruptcy or whatever so there is a you know there is a kind of prime example of this would be wikipedia Right, Wikipedia is a free service. Basically, it's a service that's created by its users. So it's all, it's literally, yeah, there are loads of people out there doing it. But you will then, as a user of Wikipedia, you'll get an email from Jimmy Well, who basically says, you know, contribute what you can, because basically if you provide us with a fiver or, or whatever it is, and um, we can keep going. And because we, you know, we use Wikipedia, um, people go, yeah, that's fine. And even if there are, how many billions of people use Wikipedia? But at the end of the day, if a small percentage gives them a fiver, they've got a very healthy revenue model. So from that point of view, right, thinking about um, pay what you want is not as suicidal as it actually kind of comes across. And the supermarket of the future, you could ultimately see somebody coming in um, and going through an auction. It is the same policies the Guardian adopted and raised their margins. Yeah, yeah. And I think I think with with all of this sort of stuff, I guess that what I'm what we're getting to is this idea of playing around with pricing, um, not treating pricing as a fixed entity within a business, but actually, you know, creating pockets and not having just one price, having mechanisms within your business that can actually create different pricing models and different um, revenue streams and being flexible on the back of that. And it's finding what works for your customers, going back to that Ford analogy or that Ford story about, you know, finding a price that works for your customers. It's what, what does your customer want from you in that respect and how you can then um, manage um, your pricing. Um, very briefly, just a slight so, sort of kind of journey around that. Um, Sky, you know, one of the most irritating television providers in a lot of respects because um, and they wait until you've, they get you to sign an 18 month contract. And then when they got you to that particular point, you phone them up, having spent a long time with them and all the rest of it. And they then stick the price up. You then spend an hour and a half renegotiating the price on the telephone with that customer. And they drop the price back down to a price that you want at the end of the day by chopping and changing the services. 
right? So it's an hour and a half of your time wasted. They end up irritating their customers, but they end up selling at the same price that they were before with chopping in things around and putting add-ons. If Sky turned around and said to their customers, what price do you want to pay? And the customer said, I wanted to pay £30 a month. And Sky says, well, for that, we can do this and create a package that gets you to this particular thing. You would end up with a far more happy customer base and you bet your bottom dollar that Sky would have a bigger number of customers. So, you know, being flexible about it and not being stuck in the ways of the past is a really crucial sort of kind of piece of understanding to think about when you come to pricing. So just one side note on Sky and any any kind of internet or telephone telephone provider in general I don't know what it is, and it's, it's very particular to the UK. Um, they don't value loyalty. So it's the same also with insurance companies as with all the things. Um, like it's a very, very different mindset. Like I come from Germany and in Germany, it's loyalty is, is um, rewarded. So your price goes down or you collect points or you have whatever it is, but they kind of want to keep you because it, obviously ret customer retention is so much more expensive than uh, so, so much cheaper than customer acquisition. But here, for some reason, I, have, I haven't figured it out. I've been 10 years in this country and I still haven't figured it out, but loyalty is means nothing to, to internet companies. But don't make that mistake because I don't value my telephone provider at all. So I don't, I don't particularly need to stay at this um, internet provider because they don't value me. So I think it's a it's a mindset thing. So always um, don't use that. That's like almost the the worst example because you you should do it exactly the opposite. The same with Sky of like irritating their customers. You have to go as a customer always to to do the effort to phone them up and and all these things rather than why can't I as a as a loyal customer get the same pricing as a new customer? It's it's. Yeah, it's just, I don't, just a side note, um, don't do it like them, <laughs> but like loyalty is so much more important, but we will talk about loyalty anyways in a second. So. Okay, right, cool. And I agree totally on that. Contingent pricing, very quickly, because we've got a few more to get through on the back of this, but contingent pricing is matching, if you like, um, customer segments with um, the kind of demand cycle of what you're doing. Um, inevitably, tour operators, holiday companies, they will have, um, they'll produce one brochure or one set, set of kind of um, hotels or whatever it is that they're doing, and they will modify the price um, basically around um, the demand for a season. So peak holidays, summertime, blah, blah, blah. Actually, if they, recon if they took out different brochures for different customers, they would on and make the offer much, much more aligned to that particular customer segment. Then their pricing would be far less volatile and they would potentially be appealing across different market spaces. So it's very, it's when you've got a lot of seasonality in your pricing, it's how do I do, how do I change the value proposition in order to match what would ultimately be a different market segment in a traditional downtime? It's a bit smarter. Um, it's probably one of the most significant pricing approaches that can maximize profitability. It's a challenge because ultimately it means that you've got to be flexible um, and targeted in your customer segments. But actually, if you've got that in your mindset and in terms of, OK, I'm not just appealing to one customer, I'm appealing to different customers, you can then start to modify the value proposition right? that uses the same underlying stuff. So what about companies that do not sell shares in the way they run different on average? Uh, what about companies that do not sell shares is the way, not entirely sure what that, what that was, but okay, I'll come, I think I, I'll come back to that. But anyway, contingent pricing, it's the holy grail. If you can get it right, it's one of the hardest things to do from that point of view. Do you keep your, the same price level, but wait, when you do contingent pricing, you keep the price the same price level for each different segment for each different customers compared to the additional pricing, or you you know you don't let your price fluctuate depending on the I don't know different the market. Or yeah, I mean you you try to minimize the volatility of the pricing. So the, in other words, rather than just simply focus upon the seasonality and lower prices when it's the off season for your product and raising prices when it's the high season for your product, 
right? Um, this is a way of ultimately reducing the volatility of your prices because what you're saying is that price can be redirected through a different value proposition to a different customer segment. So you still, at the end of the day, are offering a similar service or a similar um, outcome, utilizing the same kind of goods or whatever, but you're changing the dynamics of your customer segment. You're refocusing it on where the demand potentially would lie. Yeah. Just as the example that you were giving when we talked about it, James, was obviously you said about the holiday home. So instead of saying the holiday home in, in peak seasons, we charge very high and in low seasons, we charge very low. It's in peak seasons, we charge whatever price to um, to the you know holidays, like school um, families with children, et cetera, they're coming into in the holidays. But then in the off season, we charge a particular price maybe to, uh, retired couples who want to go on holiday at that point so that example kind of made it made it more clear in my head so that's why I kind of wanted to jump yeah. in on you um did that make sense why then you kind of you, you your price your contingent pricing doesn't actually change that much it's just you're kind of focusing on different customer segment at different time levels time time, time intervals yeah you're not making like a unified price for every every single different customer no you no it's not it's not a unified price it, it's a price but it, it's the, but you, what you're doing is is rather than just saying i've got one customer segment and i'm just going to modify the price because it's off season or peak season or whatever you're actually saying well actually hold on a second we're offering a similar thing like a holiday or accommodation or whatever it is but actually there is a different market segment that's relevant to that period of time. And what we need to be able to do is flip who we're talking to, right? From that point of view, we need to just change it. So we, we lose some of that volatility, not all of it, but some of that volatility in the price because we're more flexible about who our customer segment we're targeting. Okay. Do you rely on the assumption that people are not aware of the it's kind of like you try to you don't you know you're not sure about it uh, so you need to for example in a holiday you're gonna ask which is your age uh which is and then you actually then you can actually then uh target the the age of they yeah you 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 have to make there are certain obviously clearly assumptions that you try and that you're working to test and understand within any of that but a prime example might well be that you've got peak seasons for family holidays. You've got school holiday terms, summertime, that kind of thing. Um, but you also got peak seasons for um, business travel, right? Using the same components of what you're putting together, but you're actually appealing to a different market segment. So you're just changing the value proposition at those particular times and taking it out of what you're doing that, you know, for the, for the holiday thing and switching it into a, um, a business traveler brochure or something like that right so you're changing you're just changing the dynamic yes you're making assumptions that those markets exist but your research your thinking is all based around that kind of stuff yeah but like i said the contingent pricing model is a very um strategic model um and is really quite hard to implement um and you need a lot of technology potentially to be able to deliver it effectively but it, if you get there, it just means that you're reducing the volatility of what you're doing and making your holiday, making your your value proposition uh, more aligned to those different customer segments. Okay. Karina was asking, what about companies that do not sell shares? So in the way they run, different on average. So some companies choose not to go on the stock market market, so they have to worry less about fluctuations. I yeah, I mean, I I guess that. The, the, from that point of view, the contingent pricing of the individual stock, right? Yeah, I mean, I guess that that if you if you're not listed you're, you, on that point of view from from a stock price, then ultimately you're not going to your stock is not going to be accessible to be bought, um, and the valuation of your business is going to be harder to justify based on you know whatever it is. Um, so you know, I don't necessarily, I can't necessarily see the the specific relationship between contingent pricing and that. Um, I see there's a visibility thing. And I guess that from the point of view of where you position your stock, um, so if you're on AIM or if you're on some sort of kind of index where, um, where you're being viewed and measured in a different way, then ultimately that might, have, might be considered contingent pricing. Yeah, 
I, I, I'm, yeah. not sure. I'm not sure. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. So bundling is this is traditionally being used quite a lot by a lot of businesses, but ultimately what you're doing is got your component parts of a business. You've got the component bits and pieces, and then at the end of the day, um, you put them into a package of some description, and you're ultimately then selling the components or all the bits as one area. So you're bundling things together on that that point of view. A prime example of that would be something like um, a print house or a print company that sells um, printers or whatever, but then would bundle in photocopying paper and um, would bundle in um, cartridges, ink cartridges. And it might well be that the photocopying paper is actually end of end of line ream or something like that, that they've got a, a high holding a, a lot of stock on, but they actually just want to put the whole thing together and get rid of it. So that would bundle it in and put a price in there for all. Um, traditionally, you could you you get this again in, in the supermarket world, but again, from the point of view of that is what if you go in, you've got the buy one, get one free models, you've got the, um, you know, the kind of you know, the one penny sales, that kind of thing that, that people put together in terms of packages. So if you buy your um, if you buy your aftershave, you can buy your shaving gel, you can buy whatever it is all in one big box. And that's bundling the whole thing together and creating one unique price that potentially offers value. But in the future, the, the supermarket, it could well be that the bundling becomes a lot more um, specific to the needs of the customer again, and that the technology could well be sourcing out the best deals and the best packaging together. You get that a bit with, with say, for instance, Amazon, when if you go and buy something on Amazon, they would always say, the person that bought this last bought these three other things with it. So they create, and there's normally a small discount or a small price change or variance in that model. And so they do it obviously to increase the value of the sales, but they ultimately also do it because they are directing you um, into potentially things which are um, close to end of line, not necessarily um, prime sellers, that kind of stuff, but they're just creating the sense that they're providing you with greater value. I don't think it's that smart on Amazon, but it could be. Um, it might just be that it is smart and I've not really recognized it, but it's certainly within the future, that kind of stuff is going, it's going to become more and more relevant. And I think particularly when you've got sort of kind of baskets of stuff and all the rest of it. Um, okay, so the next one after this is individualized pricing. Um, we're getting to see more of this in the financial markets where people are buying mortgages with potentially holidays embedded within them. So if you've got a by taking a mortgage and somebody says, oh, okay, but I, you know, I'm a, I don't know, um, I'm self-employed and I don't get paid during the months of September. I go on holiday in the months of August and therefore I've got no money. So basically the, the mortgage lender says, right, okay, we'll take a holiday through that period um, and you can pay us, miss out your August payments and whatever that will alleviate some of your personalized cash flow. Going forward, um, you know, with more and more technologies, more and more, in, you know, kind of individual um, understanding, that kind of thing, then at that particular point, the chances are you could potentially put in your kind of cash flow forecast for the entire year based off a uh, former years, your earnings and all the rest of it. And you can probably end up saying to your um, supermarket, this is what I want to pay over the course of it on a monthly shop. Right. These are my the amounts I want to pay. This is what I need to do. The supermarket goes absolutely fine. No problem at all. Basically, they create longevity in the relationship. They will end up holding on to you through loyalty. Um, they will do all of those different things. They don't mind because they will take money out of you on the peak periods and they'll lower the costs or lower the pricing over the periods when you potentially got less money coming through. I talk about this now because I think going forward in the world as we know it, more and more people will have volatile earnings, not flat earnings. There'll be more and more people who will be um, working in the gig economies, working on being self-employed, working potentially um, on contracts with organizations, lots and lots of this kind of um, seasonal work, things like that. So it might well be that as a business, you'll change it up, you'll change it around, particularly if you've got a customer base, you'll actually start to engage with the personalized cash flow. And I think that that's when, you, when it gets really, really interesting and really smart, 
that you're actually doing that with your individual customers. Okay, uh, flat fees. Um, they, again, it's a kind of a core business model, but it ultimately says, right, okay, uh, ten pound. You know, ten. You know, Netflix is a prime example. They charge you a monthly fee for as many downloads as you want. Um, the gym. You know, you basically pay your monthly thing. I think it. Netflix are different. Different. They give you different packages, different bundles. They do. Yeah, they do. They give you a high definition on a low definition package. Um, they give you potentially other different sort of kind of access stuff as well. But ultimately, you're paying a flat fee to them. And you're, you know, you can download 10 films, one film, whatever it is, you know. And so from that point of view, it allows access into what you're doing. It works really well when in those sorts of environments where you've got a fixed item um, like that. And it doesn't cost Netflix any more to, to service one customer than it does for them to service a thousand. So from that point of view, um, you know, the, 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 you know, the, there's an ease within it. And the front safe, like the fun fair, you pay your 10 pound entrance, ride as many things as you want. Um, they're there anyway. So you may as well basically ride them and enjoy the time and have a good time, go around and all the rest of it, and then come out and having paid your flat fee. So it's a, it's a model, it's a securitized model in that respect, you end up knowing um, it's sticky because people like it. And so you kind of think about ways that you can build that into what you're doing. In the kind of the supermarket of the future, theoretically, you could walk into pay a fat, flat fee to a, a supermarket and just say, right, okay. And that entitles me to buy my shopping basket per month. And it's just literally delivered to your door. I can imagine that there will be stuff like that going in the future, but you know, it's it's interesting. Prime, I think, is quite a nice one from Amazon's perspective because they've obviously Prime as an offer is a flat fee, but it extends through the delivery stuff right the way through to um, you know kind of all the other bits and pieces that that it covers. But actually, um, Netflix is a is a good example where it's combining multiple price strategies, pricing strategies, because it does a flat fee. But actually, it's also that very first one with the different customer segments and, um, you know, providing value for different customers. So those who are in families and have multiple um, devices, they need a higher, they need a different package, price package from Netflix than someone who's single on their own and only have two devices, you know, um, or don't even care about HD versus uh What's the non HD SD? I can't remember. Yes, in the jet. Yeah, <laughs> it's like HD all the way. Um, but anyway, so it's kind of it's it's it, you know it's different price packages, but then also it for each of those price packages it's a flat fee. So um, that's just an, one example where it works to have multiple price strategies. As as somebody just popped up on that the screen, somebody said the the eat all you like buffet right, where you walk into a buffet and you pay your whatever, you know, kind of thing, and you can eat what you want and that kind of stuff. But if you think about the supermarket of the future as well, it might well be that they know full well, um, you know, what your kind of like Netflix can give you a 98%. Um, this is a film that you'll really enjoy based on your other watches and what you've rated. Well, going into a supermarket, they could potentially give you a direct you to whatever it is that you need to be directed to. And they can almost take you on your personalized journey around. And like I say, almost create a, um, a an aisle, which is just simply designed for you, you know, based on what your previous orders are all about. So there's lots of different ways that technology could potentially come into, into force within that. Um, okay, last one I want to touch on very quickly is discounts. I, I treat discounts with, um, yeah, okay. Hello Fresh. I don't know about Hello Fresh, but yeah, I think you're you're probably right. They are getting better and better at it. And certainly the delivery companies will get more and more focused on that. Um, from the um, point of discounts, I want to be really kind of focused on this because a lot of people rush to discount their products. They, they walk into an environment, they create a price for something. And the first thing that they do is if it's not selling or not doing anything, they'll lower the price to create a discount. Um, and they'll just do that. And the bottom line of a discount, it comes straight off profit, right? Every time you lower, like I said to you, the small changes in price at the selling price have multiple effects down the value chain when it appears in your bottom line and in the profit. The same applies to discounts. It immediately takes money out of your, your business. So 
you have to be clear on a couple of things. If you're going to discount something, right, you need to be able to clear that um, you, that the ability to be able to de deliver at that price, right, is enough to recover the loss of revenue that you're likely to um, experience. So in other words, if I've got 10,000 units of stock and I discount it by 10%, I have to recognize that I need to be able to increase the number of sales of that 10,000 to cover the cost of that discount. Otherwise, you're just giving money away. Um, but tactics are really, really crucial. Discounts should, um, uh, would you include special offers in this like Willy Wonka's golden ticket or in real life? But I, yeah, yeah, I'll come on to those, those kind of things in a, in a minute. But I mean, the, the general thing is, is that if we lower a price, we want something back, right? If we're going to give something away, we want something back. So here are a series of tactics and considerations. The ones that you will all know, early bird offers, clearly they're there to drive people in to get an early booking. The price then goes back up to the pre post early bird offer. But it has to be getting people in to pay money up front early on. That's the, ca that's the, the caveat, the one way around. Buy one, get one free, the one penny sale, clearly, right? It's, a, it's, it's an offer, it's a discount, but you are generating revenue through that full price, one price for full, and you're giving a discount. But again, you're doing it in a way where you've got enough stock and enough sales to recover that particular loss. Um, you know, getting people to share um, things, to do things creatively within the business, get a free offer or a lower price, but basically um, become a promoter to my business become an advocate for me, post something on social media, do something like that to, for those people that will share this story or share this blog, we'll give you a, a voucher or a ticket or something that lowers the particular price. Clearly, obviously referrals are a big, big part of that. You know, If you're gonna generate um, referrals to people and you're gonna offer them discounts on their third next purchase, clearly you want that kind of process to grow the um, the nature of the business, to find additional customers. So again, this is all quid pro quo, give away something, look for something in the back end coming back. Um, a, another one that the supermarkets, especially those with the big forecourt or, or garage associated, you spend a certain 50 pounds in the store and you get 10p off a litre of petrol, right? Clearly from their point of view, they've either got stocks of petrol that they pre bought a particular price, but they don't care. They just want people to spend the money in the store and that discount is recoverable based off the quantity of petrol that they're selling. All of these are really important tactics around discounts. But go, if you are going to go into the discount mindset within your products, you've got to be thinking about quid pro quo, something I am going to get back by doing this. All right. So that's the kind of the message from a discount perspective. Anything we do with the bottom line, anything we do with the top price rather comes directly off our bottom line and can really damage our business. It can also damage our brand as well. So be aware of that. Okay, if you're going to go in with a particular price in your business and you're going to come in and say, right, okay, here is a whatever discount, you're immediately saying to people, um, it's not worth what you originally thought it was worth. All right, so that's the foray through pricing. So we're going to take a 10 minute break, going to consider that. Um, think about some of those particular strategies. We're going to look at a case study when we come back to this. Uh, we're about 15 minutes behind, I think, in terms of um, the schedule. Um, so we need to make up some time on the way back, but don't worry That's about right. it. Um, let's meet up. It's uh, 33 at the moment. So let's meet up at 40. So 2.40, seven minutes. Sorry, guys. Shaved off three minutes right there. <laughs> See you back in seven right. minutes. <laughs> cool. Okay, cool. Right. Um, so the breakout session that we call, cool, thanks, Krishna. The breakout session that we're going to do now, um, we just do it a little bit shorter. It's more of a discussion that we want you to have in your in small groups. Um, 
So I'm going to uh, open the breakout rooms in a second. But um, I think best is probably to take a screenshot of the next, um, like of the case study and the exercise that we propose. So this one. So we have the company is called Chill Factor Number Nine. I'm assuming, <laughs> um, and it's an uh, it's a company that provides experience for snowboarders and skiers alike. Obviously, you can read this uh, on your own as well. But what we want you to do um, for this particular case study, once you've read it, that you're gonna kind of think about your target customer that. Um, you you think that this machine is like targeted to or the service is targeted to where would this service maybe be offered and then using the different pricing models that we've just discussed the 11 different ones and select three of those um that you could you you think could be applied and then have a discussion dim, dismiss two and tell us uh, and like choose one and tell us why you've dismissed two, those two and why you've chosen that one final one so this is the exercise, so if you want to take a screenshot of that as well. Um, and then I will put you, I will open up the breakout rooms in a second. Um, and like I said, just to have a discussion um, amongst you and um, and then we'll bring you back, have a quick discussion about your findings or your, you want to share your findings. Uh, and then we continue. Alrighty, was that any questions on that? No, cool. I will open the breakouts. Would you be able to um, send us the PowerPoint, please, to look over? Like afterwards? Um, yeah, or now to go through the slides of the different um, strategies, if that's um, possible. Yeah, I can I can quickly try to do that. Um, yeah. Sorry give me <laughs> to add that to your yeah. list. <laughs> No, that's all right. Um, I'm going to open the breakout rooms now. And while you like get, get into your breakout rooms, I will send you um, per email. I hope you all got my email with the starting in 10 minutes. So um, I will send it via that. So um, cool. Uh, Lauren and James, you will probably be automatically pushed into the breakout room. So just come back into the main room. And I will see you in 20 minutes. um how was that how um how did you find that exercise was it helpful what were your findings what do you want to present something <laughs> um yeah what was share let us know what kit did you come up with what was the two pricing strategies um or the three that you came up with the two that you dismissed and the one that you went in for in the end and why who wants to go? Ma, um, um, yeah. Madalina, uh, Madalina and I, we try, we were, we were thought for the two main, three actually, three main price decision. For that was bundling was, I thought we thought it was essential because depending on different pricing preferences for people, we can differentiate the price. For example, who was, for example, interested in, just one trial, one way, one way of trying the snowboarding. We could tell, okay, you give it, you 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 pay ten pound, you, we give you one way. Whereas for people who are more interested, for example, for a basic a basic a beginning training for snowboarding, we can say, okay, we give you like seven seven days tickets, and then you can come for seven days, and and then you can then you can train for seven days, something like that. So we went and we were giving like packages together. We are packaging different offers for to give into the people. But as well, for when in the long in the long run, we were thinking of price market expansion. So we were thinking, okay, we 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 gain more, and then we try to, for example, buy more more than one platform and expand our business all over. For example, our big city. We can okay, let's start, we we're thinking like in London. We start with one machinery, then we save margins to buy a new machinery and then expand all over the city, for example. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Good. I mean, it's a nice approach to think about, I think, even for all of your own businesses. So if you're getting stuck on like what your strategies are, actually, you know, take this deck out and just kind of 
work your way through the different price strategies and what it would mean for you and your, like for your business and your customer um, and potentially come up with some new like ideas and strategies of expanding, you know, and, and coming up with different packages that you maybe not have thought before. So cool. Uh, what about the other team? What did you guys come up with? Uh, we uh, chose contingent uh, pricing, discounts, and flat fees, and uh, finally uh, zeroed in on flat fees, uh, discounts because it's it's driven mostly by loyalty. But this is seen as more mostly like impulsive, occasional use, or um, you know, just a special occasion. Uh, sort of a thing. Uh, we did, uh, however, come out with three different customer uh, segments. One is special um, needs children, uh, people would, who, who needs motor skill coordination, so wellness, uh, cognitive development, that sort of space. Second is uh, an additional, uh, you know, users in, in the gym, like, uh, like Pilates, yoga, and you have this key things, training. And uh, number three was in the arcade, uh, just like you have your uh, spa uh, chairs, uh, I mean, the massage chairs. Uh, and then we didn't, uh, we discounted uh, discounts because, uh, you know, people are not going to be loyal. You know, going to be the same person is not coming. So uh, that's why we felt flat fees would be better. Contingent pricing because we felt uh, flat fees is a lot more better because even though we have three different customer base, uh, we didn't see much of variation in uh, in terms of the usage, except probably uh, the season um, when it's like winter. People might want to have that experience before they actually go out and ski. Mm -hmm. Like peak times on weekends and stuff like that would be higher priced than during the week, which would be lower. Okay. I mean, there's no. I think there's no right or wrong. You can justify and argue, I guess any of the pricing strategies. And that's kind of the beauty uh, and the curse, I guess, um, that, that you, if you wanna do something like that for your own business, but it's all like, as long as you look at your customer and can derive of what you think might be the best strategy for that particular customer into driving the value, um, yeah, you can argue, I guess, a lot of them, but it's just nice to see like, you had like very different, well, I guess the flat, fee was kind of a similar approach, but you had different customer segments and different locations and uh, different strategies. So um, cool, love it. <laughs> Moving on. Um, I think it's uh, just wrapping up. We have a few more things on pricing we wanted to mention, but we wanted to put this first because um, of the pricing strategy. So the first bit that we wanted to mention is the problem with cost pricing. Yeah, I think um, one of the one of the sort of kind of main problems with this is that, that when you're in that sort of situation, you it's again, nobody's really that interested in what something costs to deliver it. So when you're standing in the queue for a Starbucks, your mind's not thinking about how, you know, what percentage of my coffee is made up of milk, beans, processes, staffing costs, everything else like that. At the end of it all, it's that perception once more that of that price and value and what it represents to us. And ultimately, it's quite interesting at the moment in the coffee market because clearly McDonald's have laid a foundation of cheap coffee and um, and the like, and have really played on this sort of kind of simple coffee model. Whereas Starbucks quite clearly is still sort of kind of very focused upon um, the kind of more deluxe range of coffees and things like that. And then of course there's all of the intermediary cafes and stuff like that around there but it's it's I think the important thing out of anything and when we talk about this before one of the things when costs do matter in the sense that they provide a sanity check for um, our businesses through kind of a break-even analysis and the way that we look on on different things so the kind that the the traditional cost plus pricing model Although it, it falters when it comes to actually delivering something which is meaningful of value, if we go through the pricing process and we look at what those, those prices we are, that we are generating, then ultimately it's a, a sanity check on both the brand, the business and the model and the way that we're trying to work it. 
So in this particular instance, it, 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 the kind of the cost plus thing, there is a problem when it comes to actually validating it for value purposes. But don't ignore costs just simply because, you know, we're focused on that one kind of exchange. So the other kind of model that people look at very much is that kind of competitor based pricing model, which is literally where we look at a marketplace and we um, we analyze and we look at all of the relevant competitors that exist within that market. And we price our particular product in a particular way, which is um, aligned to or in the midst of all of those relevant um, you know, cups of coffee or whatever. So I think on the next slide, Mag, do we go into the kind of the, the, the again, you know, the customer when they've walked through your shop door, where it doesn't matter whether it's online or whether it's physically or whatever, they, they're interested in buying from you. They're not interested in buying from the competition. So ultimately what you're charging and what you're doing, if you're basing your pricing upon, um, you know, kind of all of the competitors and all of what they bring to the marketplace, then you're ignoring at the end of the day, your value, the value that you're bringing to that particular um, situation. So again, it, it's about how it chimes with um, your audience, your customers and how that matters. So if we just simply stack ourselves up against, I don't know, McDonald's, Starbucks, whoever it is, or the, or the coffee shop next door, then at that particular point, we're losing our own credibility. We're losing our own authenticity around our price and what it actually means. Um, and the prime example of that is, is you can build a price that reflects um, your kind of input, your your what you're about, your values, the, the things that matter to you. And if it matters to your customers, then they will, at the end of the day, settle with that particular price and deal with it. So... The final bit, and we've touched on this so many times um, when we've been talking about it, is the value-based pricing model around this. And it, and we use within you know, Essex Startups, we use a thing which is the value proposition canvas. And it's a tool that we talk about quite a lot because it, it is this product market fit. It's this idea that there is a value proposition at a customer segment. And what we're actually looking at doing is matching right what we're delivering the job that we are doing for those particular customers and getting that that particular um area right is all about matching out all of those relevant bits the pains the gains the jobs that we're trying to do and getting that to work in a particular way um, is really what value pricing is all about it's getting that particular match and what we're doing with all the other bits within that is making the business work making things work within that environment so as i said that the, this this idea of the costs are there but they don't matter is not quite right they do matter when it comes to actually sanity checking what we're about but again i would i would recommend that this kind of customer centric pricing is hugely important because it really does put ourselves in our customers shoes and if that if you know if we're having a conversation with the customer and the customer is um wholly on board with what we're talking about they see the value of that particular piece of delivery then the the price itself becomes far less of a dividing factor between yourself and them so I just wanted to run through once more with you, just for your kind of mind, the break even formula, all right? Because um, it is just something that you can play around with. You can manipulate a little bit, you can dive. And like I say, then at that particular point starts to engage with um, a kind of an understanding about a sanity check about what this particular business is all about. So, the break even itself um, is really the fixed costs of the business, the things at the end of the day that you're um, that you have identified that the business is going to incur, regardless of whether you sell one unit or 20 units. And then ultimately, if you've got that fixed cost as a pound notes or a number that sits there, then at the, what you want to do is each unit of activity that you are providing, there is a cost of delivery and a selling price. 
And once the cost of delivery or the selling price less the cost of delivery is defined as, if you like, the gross margin or the contribution for that piece of um, activity. So fixed cost divided by that contribution will give you the break even in units, the number of units I need to sell to recover all of those fixed costs. On a chart, it looks a bit like this. So you've got the, basically your fixed costs. You've got the contribution that, grow, that grows with that. And at some particular point, you will find that break even over time. Ideally, what we want to do is we want to create that break even in our pricing model um, as soon, if you like, with certainly within six to eight months of activity so that we're so that we're basically saying that everything beyond that six month period or seven month period or whatever it is, is then is an added profit that the, it's not going. We've covered our fixed costs. We've done all of that. So what does it mean for for this particular process? So in this example, we've got a workshop and basically they've got operating expenses of 125 grand. They want to break even in six months. Um, they can deliver two workshops a month at a cost of delivery of six and a half thousand per workshop. The question is, is at what price do they need to sell each workshop to achieve that break even in time? So very simply, it's a question of filling in the blanks within that process. So as you can see, the fixed costs were 125,000. The selling price is unknown. So ultimately, that's the thing that we need to think about. Um, the costs of each workshop is 6,500, and they've got 12 um, units of delivery that they can do. So at that particular point, we can notice that the selling price is the thing that we want to manipulate and actually position. So a really simple piece of algebraic movement around. We end up with... If we go into that, we end up with, right? So we end up basically saying that 125,000, blah, 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 all of that bit of manipulation. So at the end of it all, what we're saying is, is we need to sell each workshop for 16,917 pounds to actually break even, all right? Within that, within that frame. Bottom line then is, is that, that what we're actually then saying is, is that, is that feasible? Is that a possibility? Can we sell a workshop for nearly £17,000? Now, you could easily dismiss that and say, clearly not. But then if you're adding real value into that workshop, and if you're getting enough people into that workshop that you can deliver it, and you're doing it online, and you're creating assets on the back of it, and you're doing lots of other activity, then maybe it's possible. But if it's not possible, then ultimately what you need to be thinking about is how do I can do more? How do I do more workshops? Do I do an online delivery and a physical face-to-face? -face? Do I do something which is um, more about um, half-day workshops and charging slightly less price, but doing more of those? You manipulate the business model and the value proposition to get to the particular point whereby you can start to change some of those particular variables. So what I'm saying is, is that at the end of the day, the costs matter as a function of the selling price, just simply because we want to sanity check our kind of thinking and the way to the marketplace. If at the end of the day, we realize that for the workshops that we're doing, 17,000 pounds isn't actually that great an amount of money. And that when we actually start thinking about what we need to be selling that for, then that's what we can do. We can actually sell that particular workshop. So again, it's just figuring that around and manipulating it. But it does mean that costs do matter. But at the end of the day, when we go back to that value pricing, we can ultimately start to think about maybe manipulating some of the costs within the business as well. Do we need to cover that 1225,000? Is there stuff that we can do to reduce that? Stuff that we can reduce the delivery of it, different facilitators, whatever. So it's all about sanity checking stuff. Sure. Any questions? Okay. Um, I'm going to just quickly run through the four C's of pricing, um, which is, I don't think this model exists. I think it came, um, James and I were discussing pricing and then that was kind of, we came up with four different words and they were all C's. So <laughs> that was the, the four C's of pricing have been born. So this is trademark, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then James came up with this wonderful little drawing. Um, looks a little bit complex, but basically what it is, we have context, 
you have when you when it comes to pricing you have to look at the four c's so that's what we're saying so you have to look at the context you have to look at your customers you have to look at your consideration of strategy and you have to look at your costs um in context what we mean by that is it's very very specific to what your business is about so obviously you do your research you do your market research you you look at the industry that you're operating in you know you look at your competitors you look at um what types of product are you actually like selling is it a digital product is it a physical product is it a service what is the experience behind that so you're looking at all of these things because all of that matters all of that takes into consideration of what is the perception of your customers out there what is the brand value that you want to create um and like we said it's not simply looking at your competitors and kind of saying oh yeah i'm fitting right in there but with the price um but actually saying okay so what can i do it's just like a piece of information to look at the competitors because you need to like it's clarity to understand what the market is and how are, how are your competitors operating in that same market space um but how can you be different how can you stand out so you kind of all of those things that you do for your when you're starting out on your business and you're doing a lot of market research you're doing these things anyways these research this context um you're looking into anyway so you have already a knowledge but when you're then looking at pricing you need to reconsider all of these things just so you're you're kind of getting a more an understanding of what is this market that you're operating in and then the next thing is obviously you're looking at your customers like we said the entire time like you need to have your pricing your customers at the sort of at the center of your pricing like what is the um what are there obviously the the pains and gains that you are creating for them or relieving for them what's the value that you're driving but then also what is the the um the perception of you know what can you create for them that they perceive as, as a lot of value um and you're solving a problem for them um and that would obviously change your pricing as well and um again also your branding comes into into that particular bit as well um how is the perception from the customer's point of view the perception there and looking at different segmentations so you might have different like we said before we have different customers for different different activities or different seasons or time seasons or you know you just have multiple segments and therefore your pricing might be very dynamic to specific to that customer's um needs and perceptions etc and then the consideration of strategy is kind of yeah looking at your brand what is actually the the brand that you want to create is it you know is it a premium brand is this, what is the the perception there that you want to want to create obviously you might not be at that point but you need to kind of think about your branding um where do you want your branding to go and and therefore also is that branding needs to be in line with then that pricing strategy or the pricing strategy needs to be in line with the branding whichever way around but it is related to one another that you know if you if you want to get into the premium product and your customers are like high um profit or high um disposable income kind of clients they want you know they want prestige with their brands that they buy they want a reputation that the brand represents so you need to kind of think about that you can't then you know sell it for 99p if that makes sense you know like you have to um consider consider that kind of aspect who is that customer and therefore your brand needs to be aligned with that customer um and looking at at that kind of thing that the same like we always call when we look at branding um and at your competitor is also good to look at your um at the matrix at the like product placement or like competitor placement matrix I don't remember what it's now called. Um it's the it's the <laughs> what is it called the branding where you kind of basically you're looking at where do you on on two variables uh, on a on a cross you kind of look at where your competitors in the market sit and then you kind of put your brand where you want to be or where you where you see your customers are um actually perceiving you it's more a perception thing but perceiving your brand to be and therefore that can also dictate a lot of or influence your pricing strategy um maps i think aren't they positioning sorry? maps positioning, positioning maps positioning. yeah thank you yeah. yeah. I mean, I said the word, but I don't know what it comes to me. Um, and then last but not least, I mean, obviously, yes, like we said, um, you have to consider your costs, obviously, 
but more like we just made at the point with the break even is more of a sanity checking that you the price like all of these other things that you kind of took into consideration you decided on a price and then i think it's it's a good measurement to then look at your costs or measure to then look at your costs and look at how uh, am i in line with where i want to break even am i in line with um you know is there enough profit margin in there or uh, in general like am i making any kind of profit margin in there you know and then obviously that dictates whether you have to potentially rethink all of those considerations because you might not cover your costs or it's then a a number or a measure to then tell you okay i need to find um you know lower price suppliers or whatever it is like think more frugal um so it's kind of just those four c's are really literally anything that influences your price and that you need to in con in take into consideration when you want to come up with your own pricing strategy or the price for your products any questions on that no okay then we have one final thing on pricing on psychology of pricing before we get get a break and then we go into sales um okay so one of the things that i wanted to say i mean clearly psychology and, and pricing is there's a there's a whole myriad of different things but this this i think is hugely important confidence if you've got confidence and self-belief in what you're offering you've got an understanding of where the value of your business is you've got that confidence um, in terms of um, being able to articulate your business, articulate um, why you're, you know, why you are delivering this value, and that ultimately showing where that differentiation lies, then you have the real chance of of achieving a price which is representative of the true value of what you're doing. So confidence is something that doesn't just simply um appear you have to work at it you have to um constantly kind of find small wins that give you um that sense of self-belief that efficacy that you are delivering something which is really effective and the right thing to do and it takes it takes patience um and from an you know from personal experience when i i started out selling um I'd certainly, yeah, leadership and customer insights, absolutely. Leadership stems from that and having that real insight into the customer. But I mean, I I bought a franchise when I got, I got was working up in London. I got made redundant in 2011. And by 2012, I needed to think about what I wanted to be doing. So I ended up buying a franchise in education. It was a Canadian business. And um, they took me away. They educated me. They told me that um, how to sell um, different products but actually when you sat in front of a people a family and a child and a student and all the rest of it and you were asked to sell um education to them at something in the region of about 40 pounds 45 pounds an hour and you're doing it from a position that you've never done it before and you're and you're doing it from the point of view where you don't believe that what you're offering is really value for money and you haven't got that confidence and the, your body language, your mannerisms, your um, your eye contact, your the, the hesitancy that you hand over a piece of paper, a contract, something like that, um, it immediately manifests itself in a resistance to buy. And the it takes time to break through that particular hurdle. And you've got to find the mechanisms and the words to be able to do this. But by the end of that four years of working in that environment, and by the end of that four years, and having had two, two, three hundred students that we'd worked with over that period of time, actually, then your confidence and psyche completely changes because you know that it works. You know that the delivery is really good. You know that the systems that are embedded behind this, the processes, all of that stuff around the price that we were talking about, all of that really, really does create value and your body languages shift, your, your whole mindset shifts and your words and the way that you talk about your business, that changes. And eventually we were converting pretty much 100% of every time that we actually walked into somebody's living room. They really believed that we could deliver and we did deliver. And we had 
um, lots of conf lots of customer recommendations. We had lots of um, insights. We had all of that good stuff that was there. And it was just simply that word on your own point of view, that psychology, not the psychology from the point of view of where, you know, setting a price on the rest of it, but it was a psychology, a mindset that literally helped you deliver this in terms of a price that worked for us. So it takes time, work at it, build the confidence, build the language around the business, build a deep appreciation for where the value is and the problems that you are addressing with the customer. Okay, and that's where potentially we now move on to sales and the importance of that. Cool. Any questions on this? Otherwise, we're going to go in a 10 minute break and I give you two more minutes because I shaved off three minutes earlier. <laughs> so, okay. Um, you can have, if you have any questions, obviously pop, pop, uh, pop them in the chat or chat to us in the break. But um, I will see you. It's now 3.33. Jinx. Um, I see you at 3.45. <laughs> Recording. And um, yeah, we're now going to go into sales. So sales is not, um, we're not going to do like a huge amount in the sales just because it overlaps a lot with other things that we've already covered. Um, and also that goes more into marketing, but obviously sales are not really focused on a lot. Um, I think in general, because they really overlap. You can't look at sales in isolation anyways. Um, you can't look at pricing in isolations anyways, and you can't look in marketing in isolation. So they all really overlap um, and not necessarily in this order. It's just kind of a representation of the overlap between the three because they they the considerations that you put into your pricing that we were discussing with the four C's, you, you do exactly the same kind of considerations when you're thinking about your sales strategy or your marketing. Um, when you think about your marketing in general, you think about your, how, how can I market? How can I create awareness um, about me and my product, my brand building, you know, and all of that obviously also again leads into pricing and leads into sales. So it's all really overlapping and like going, um, hand in hand. So you can't really look at all of them uh, in, in isolation. However, we want to try and look at sales a little bit on its on, on their own. But you will see that it's all interrelated anyways. So again, with everything, I mean, we uh, in Essex startups, we always look at customers. Um, because we believe a lot of times when we start out, we 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 think about us we think about like what would we like to do and that's fair enough because you're the owner of your business and you want to kind of create something that fits into your lifestyle and what you kind of look into but then it's actually looking at the market looking at the customer what problems you're solving so you then start thinking about your customers along the journey a little bit more but oftentimes we come back to us and kind of think okay what is the price that i feel confident of charging, you know, like we were just saying about the psychology of our own confidence as well. And um, on on the note that James was talking about his business was the same with my business back in the days when, when I was uh, a wedding photographer, you know, that's a very personalized service and it's a very one-on-one -on -one service and um, normally a very high priced service. So, but there goes a lot of confidence um, in, into what you think you are worth. And that's, um, that's really like, especially when you're starting out, you don't have that much experience. So you you sometimes slash your prices and I see it every day still in the photography world. Um, and as you gain experience, you grow with that and actually your customer shifts a little bit as well. But all, having said all those things, so we bring it back to us, but actually what we need to do is then, okay, who's that customer again? Because even in the, in the wedding industry, not every bride is the same bride. You know, you have to kind of find what is the niche that you're looking at and what is the, the customer um, that you want to target and that you want to kind of serve, let's put it more that way, rather than target. And, and for that, you obviously have to also understand your customer, but you also have to build relationships, genuine relationships with your customers. And I'm, I'm a strong believer. I mean, obviously a wedding photography service is a very personalized service. So it's it's easier than maybe a, a product that's, you know, less um, emotion, emotive, but maybe you can, you find ways that, that you make it more personal, you make it more emotive, but building that relationship with your customer is really key. 
Um, because like we said before, we want to do value. We want to drive value to them. We want to solve something specific to their needs um, and, and really build that value in, in our pricing, in our whole business model, in the brand. It's, it's all about um, solving those problems for them. And then equally with that obviously becomes you're building trust. And when you're building trust, you're genuinely building a relationship and you're probably giving them a lot of value. And all of that obviously comes into your pricing. It goes into your marketing, but it also goes into your sales strategy. Again, looking at customers, you want to create emotions. Um, you know, you want to be emotive. You don't want to, if it's just a product to you and it's not very, that those emotions are not attached to it. It's harder to sell sometimes something that's, uh, or to upsell because it's again, that brand perception that you want to create in the customer that this is something that A, they need, obviously, yes, you want to genuinely serve them and, and create value, but also with emotion, sometimes you, you create attention, you, you make them aware of who you, like who you are and that you're actually building those or like giving them that value and serving them and therefore building that um, relationship. So emotions is really um, a key thing. I mean, we, yes, we make decisions. We make decisions a lot on, on facts and figures and whatnot, but actually the emotions are the drivers then to actually press that button and like, you know, you know what, I just want to have this, um, you know, so there's a lot of things that you can build um, when you know what kind of emotions you can trigger in the customer. And then, but then equally on the sales side, you also want to make sure um, to actually then convert your customers in, in the end to drive that decision-making. And I'm not saying like, I. I used the word force before, but like it's more in bunny ears that you don't want to obviously force them into a decision that's wrong for them, but you know, it, this is the right, you know, solver of their problem. Um, and so you need to kind of drive decision-making um, at the end of the process. And we will touch on that a little bit, but obviously all of it also comes into the psychology of your customer. So the psychology of your, your customers, but also the psychology of you again, in, in terms of your confidence, um, how you want to drive your sales strategy. And for that, um, obviously we, I think we probably all have seen this, this chart before. Um, it's the, the typical sales funnel, but this is kind of how you built your initial strategy of kind of looking at your sales funnel. Um, and at every stage you want to, you know, create something um, for that customer, like I said, building that relationship, driving those values, um, sparking an interest in that very first initial thing is the awareness stage. You, if you make sure that you are actually solving something for a customer and that you genuinely want to build trust and build value and build that relationship with them, you need to make them aware of you. You know, you need to first obviously spark that interest and, um, but first impressions count. So you need to Make sure that your website is potentially, um, you know, in the right kind of frame of mind when they first land on the website, that they know where to go, think that there is a lot of information that they need. It's in the language and in the tonality of your brand, and which, again, is based on, off of your customer and their tonality uh, and their language that they're using, et cetera, et cetera. So it's kind of making sure that when you have cold leads who know nothing about you, they very first touch, like when you look at your Facebook page or when you look at your Instagram page, what do customers see that never have heard of you? Do they actually see something that might spark an interest or is this all like, oh, where is the website? Like I can't find, and then they lose interest. So you need to make sure that you guide the customer through the sales funnel by leaving very first step, make a first impression. And then obviously when they when they came to your website, maybe the website is already like a second imp impression because they found you on Facebook. So Facebook was the first impression and then they kind of clicked on your website and came there. Then, then it's time to kind of, the next stage is building trust and being that emotive and offering that value and making them understand like what you're about. You genuinely wanna like spark a conversation potentially. I mean, it, it really depends again on what product you're doing. So for me, it was the cold leads is usually, so when I, when I was a wedding photographer, the cold, cold leads would be, for example, um, maybe it was an ad I was running or it was kind of, you know, flyers I was giving out, whatever it was, or maybe at a wedding fair, I was having a stall, whatever the very first awareness stage was, 
but then it's kind of like luring them in the positive sense, not in the negative sense, luring them in and kind of having a genuine conversation. So that's why I really loved wedding fairs, but very particular niche wedding fairs that were my target customers, not you know, the Excel like mass, like serving to the masses, that wasn't my customer. So I knew exactly who my customer was. And therefore I was only exhibiting at fairs that were particular for that particular customer. And when they did come in, like initially it was obviously the stall. There are lots of people there. There are lots of stalls there. There are lots of exhibitors there. But then if you kind of have a first impression, you have maybe some, some albums lying out. And then this is just an example, obviously. But you have like the, the first kind of impression. They see you. They don't want to make eye contact at the very first. It's really funny. Like I learned a lot about when I was doing fairs because the initial stages, they just want to browse. They don't want to talk to the vendor yet. Um, so they're kind of just browsing. But you give them the information. It's that's the first impression. You give them what they need. Then they kind of start like, you know, they stopped, looked at the albums. So they get, became a little bit more warmer in that sense. I didn't like, I left them to kind of just browse a little bit more. And if, it, if I could feel that, that, you know, they were really like, um, not just flicking through the album, but actually looking at a lot of details and then looking at the other pictures, that kind of thing. And maybe potentially looking then for a um, flyer or a um, business card to take home. That's when I then stepped in and actually started building a, a, a report with them. You know, I kind of start like asking about their wedding, you know, have they chosen a venue? Have they found a date yet? What, whatever, whatever it is that lures them in in that sense but it was just a genuine conversation it, nothing you know nothing of like salesy um like throwing it at them but just trying to have a conversation and then it becomes obviously it goes further down that funnel of sometimes they're like they might be yeah 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 we're super interested whatever you know but sometimes they might just have a very um you know a little bit colder conversation not very like immediately jumping in um, so it's just reading the reading the customer at that point. If it's obviously not a personal one-on-one -on -one conversation that you might have with them, this could be where you provide a lot of information on your website and then you give them kind of always, always make sure that each page on your website has some kind of way to give them a to-do at the end, give them a call to action at the very end, whether, you know, read about the about me here or you know like here's our um price packages click here whatever it is you want to drive them through basically creating that kind of customer um experience on just your website but do that with everything do that also thinking about your facebook page potentially or the content that you're putting out what kind of content are you putting out that's interesting to the customer to re-engage and always come back to you um, and, and just be genuine and building that report, I think is a very, very big key on here. And then, like I said, at the end, um, obviously the decision that you wanna make, you wanna force them into the decision is that they're gonna call you, they contact you, they're gonna buy whatever it is that you want at the end, depending again on your product. Like for me, I didn't have a buy, buy now product, uh, you know, so I, nobody would like to prick, uh, click on that, but it was a contact me or get my like get in touch for the pricing brochure or whatever it was so that they got you know um i mean for my particular thing it doesn't wasn't very time sensitive unless i would say you know if it's a popular date get in touch earlier than rather than later you know that kind of thing but it's kind of forcing them into making a decision but overall all of it is all about creating that experience for your customers. And that's why sales and marketing is so interrelated because all of this, you could say, well, that's marketing. Yeah, it is because all of your marketing efforts need to fill that sales funnel, need to kind of create that experience, guide them through to actually make that decision to that you are the right one, that you are buying that you're the one that they need to buy from, that you're solving a problem for them and delivering a lot of value to them. So on that note, obviously is very important is the customer journey. So you have the different phases of the customer journey um, and that's you know when they first become aware of you all the way to that they actually purchased, repurchased, and then also like wanna potentially take shout off the rooftops of you. Like they become that your biggest fans and therefore your biggest drivers of referrals potentially depending on your, on your, um, on your business. But 
it's kind of making sure you understand how that customer journey works. And this is just an example of like, you know, where different kind of marketing channels fit in, but you, this is not a one size fits all business. So this is just an example, but it kind of gives you the idea of how your marketing channels can guide somebody through that customer journey and where your sales come in. At what point do you actually provide them you know, I mean, the sales come if you want to say, you know, at the purchase level, that's when you would drive sales. But actually, it starts at the awareness, at the awareness stage, that's when they start to filter into that customer into that sales funnel. So this whole thing is, is up to the purchase where they make the purchase, it's the first um, sales funnel, and then keeping them retain and keeping them like become, they're becoming your biggest fan that's a marketing e effort of keeping the customer loyalty you know I mean that's why I'm saying like internet internet providers and whatnot have this wrong because they kind of lose everybody at that purchase end of purchase kind of experience um, so make sure you have a rounded customer um, journey and on every single touch point along that journey you need to make sure that you are providing you're building that report you're providing value to them you're you're genuine in your conversations etc cetera, etc cetera. so you're not losing them along the way because that's a lot of effort you build all that and then all of a sudden for example in this example you have at just before the purchase the cashier wasn't very helpful helpful so that already like um you know they had they they made a decision that they want to purchase and then they come into the store and everything is fine. And then, I mean, in this example, they still went on obviously, but just remember like a lot of those customers will not convert if at some point in that purchasing process, they might, um, you know, something is not right. So you have to kind of think about your touch points with the customers and on each touch point, make sure that, you know, you're, you're selling in the genuine sense and you're making an experience for the customer and that it actually works because oftentimes we forget the customers when we are creating our website when we are creating all of these things um or, you know it's yeah obvious to buy now but you want to be emotive you want to like guide them through that they almost have no choice to buy in the end like in the sense of that they are so you know they are like ready that right there to buy so you have to kind of think about your customer touch points in these things right and then we go obviously sales also has a lot to do with psychology with your own psychology like we said before with the confidence um gaining experience along the way you are going to get more confident in your sales process and obviously this is a you know ever living thing with anything in your business you are always going to adjust and reevaluate and um you know come back to it at some point but I did want to talk about um, some of the things from the customer's perspective. So the psychology behind like the sales or at least part of the things that you need to kind of uh, consider is, you know, one is you need to kind of create um, certainty. So you need to engage with what are their doubts about either your particular service or product or in general, the market of that product and service. You know, like maybe there are some doubts that a lot of customers have that, um, you know, they, they, they are reluctant to buy because they think it's not, oh, do I actually really need this and have a lot of doubt, especially like when it comes nowadays, I think people are much more, when it comes to the privacy of their data, they become much more reluctant to give them away. And so it's just kind of, if your product is in that data security kind of market, for example, you need to, you need to engage with those doubt and you need to kind of almost head on, like, we know you're, you're not, you know, you can trust whatever it is um, that you're going to create and whatever your, your sales pitches are along that way. But you need to kind of create certainty and engage with those doubts that they might have and challenge your customers um, to rethink those uh, doubts potentially. You want to reinforce the positive. So obviously, you know, you want to listen to what the customers are actually saying. Um, and maybe, you know, yeah, yeah, I hear that a lot, like especially you probably have like reoccurring, reoccurring customer um, feedback potentially. So listen to that and reinforce those uh, positive statements or obviously also negative statements and then um, reevaluate that where you can improve, but also um, 
you know, maybe highlight it for them of like, oh, amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear that a lot. And that's why we've now brought in this aspect and, you know, and like make them part of the conversation. Because again, that builds trust, that engages them, that makes it emotive, you know, and, and they can see that you are the, the best option to buy from, if that makes sense. Um, let the customer do the selling. Well, I mean, this is kind of rather than you selling obviously to them, it's almost like let them do their research, let them come back, circle around, you know, and then they see that you're maybe potentially the one with the best value. You are the one like be confident in that as well. But then also um, they like to kind of make their own decisions. So um, let let them do the, the selling almost in their own heads and their own things in, in, in your arguments, in the thing that how you sell to them um, by building genuine report, by building that relationship to your customers, they will come back. You know, they might go circle away and kind of look at features and attributes, but actually it's then the purpose, the mission, the brand that you stand for, the, the, the thing that the product market fit because you're solving a particular need um, or problem for them that's then kind of, they they do the selling for themselves almost or like for you. So they come back to you in that sense. And then the last point was just keeping the meet, uh, keep meeting the needs is, um, you know, we do as customers, we do like having a experience of always having our like needs met. And therefore you need to kind of, again, reinforce that report, reinforce the value that you're driving um, and, and even if they don't like something about your particular product or something, then maybe you fix it or you, you kind of take that feedback on and go back to them and like, thank you for your contribution. This was really helpful. You know, just keep kind of reinforcing that, um, yeah, meeting their needs or that their needs are met in, in that sense. And then these are just some like general, I mean, you can find more than these. Um, on in the internet, if you kind of look like sales tips or um, I found like lots of like infographics, which were kind of fun. Um, but I just wanted to quickly touch on those four because I feel like they, they kind of like the sales techniques that are easily implemented. So the first one is obviously social proof. We all know that like showing how many, um, you know, likes and shares an article potentially has or a product has or reviews has, you know, I mean, reviews is like the biggest thing. So consumers feel like they, they, um, what their peers approve, they need to kind of approve too. And then they kind of trust it more. So social proof is like psychology, psychology wise is a big thing. Um, even if it's almost subconsciously, um, but it is, if you can see reviews, I mean, I, I personally, I only buy, like if I see reviews of any, like if I go on Amazon, for example, and I look for something, I decide a lot of our decision factors are coming from reviews and seeing that there's, if I have like three, three items or two items that are completely identical, price is very similar. I go, usually go for the one with the higher reviews or not that that necessarily says something, but that's just how I personally, for example, depending on the product, make make a decision. And so social proof is just really, really big. Um, so don't underestimate estimate that. If you have a Trustpilot account, like use it, or if you don't, you create one potentially, depending on your product, whether it works that way. Um, obviously, if you have a lot of negative, then, then you can learn a lot from that as well, but social proof in general and reviews are like a big, big thing. Loss aversion, um, I mean, that's kind of, uh, we are humans, we don't like to lose. <laughs> we don't like, we like to avoid loss at any kind of cost. So, um, and this might be also just a perception of loss. Um, so in marketing, that loss can really force a decision. Um, and this is kind of coming back also to pricing strategies or discounts or any kind of strategies where you want to create like a forced or force them into decision making more by like time sensitivity, uh, maybe scarcity. You know, this is like an early bird deal and only the first 10 customers will get it or whatever it is. But or it could also be like stop wasting time on this and that and the other buy this instead or, you know, like having arguments around um time wasting or, or money wasting things. Um, so loss aversion can also be a very good um, strategic thing or like a psychology kind of sales tip, I guess. Um, 
anchoring. Anchoring is a lot because we we love to compare. It's just not hopefully not ourselves because that uh, comparisonitis is always uh, is the death of creativity and joy. But we do like compare products and services. Um, so in the human minds, we always need a reference of some something. You know, we need to anchor it in our in our brain. So um, so this is like coming into where you can have potentially discounts or a bonus or even those price packages we were talking about. So a lot of people offer price packages and then the middle one or the third one, if you're four, for example, is like the best value because it gives you all of these features, but the price increase is not, you know, is not as, as perceived as such a high one. Um, so that a lot of people go for that middle one. It's just a, it's just, you get more for the buck, but then it's not perceived as premium. So it's kind of like an in-between. It's a lot of people like that comparison of having all these different price fee, uh, price packages. The foot in the door is, again, we like to make connections, human connections, and um, we feel we always sometimes have to honor that bond. So if, even if we're making a connection on LinkedIn or on Facebook or something, but if you as the business owner start to engage with that connection, they feel they have to engage back um, a lot of times. And that might just be a retweet, a retweet, or it might just be a like or something, but then having your content at ready that is particular maybe for that sales stage that they're at so you kind of um, build content around that might just be engaged like forcing them to engage or not forcing them but like um, encouraging them to engage with your content and that's already like a foot in the door kind of thing so that can be very valuable as well and then last but not least is authority um, we do love and trust uh, authority figures and uh, we do love and trust a leader and therefore, um, you could establish, for example, yourself as being an expert at something, whether that's in your industry or whether that's, you know, in, in particularly like a lot of people, that's why a lot of people or coaches go into um, like talking, um, public speaking, writing a book, you know, that's kind of building an authority. But you could also do it differently in, in terms of um, you could do a podcast um, series, for example, and build your authority yourself. But then you could also collaborate with other experts in other industries and other products, but like um, in other fields of expertise and you bring them in and that kind of establishes your authority as well. Um, does that make sense? I, I see the chat was somebody put something, hold on. Yeah, yeah certification um uh, definitely i think any kind of um did you put that on for the authority or for the social proof authority <laughs> authority yeah. yeah um yeah absolutely any kind of certification can be authority um let it, it's 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 again kind of showing that you know this is this is uh good stuff it's almost also like show, social proof even though social is always like social media proof, but it could also be saying that, you know, if you have a certified in being organic, then that's a trust building exercise or your fair trade or whatever that's tr building that trust and um, proof. James, you were unmuting yourself. Yeah, I was, just, I was just saying that's why it's so important to focus in on things like your LinkedIn profile and getting referrals from people and getting testimonials from people. Because I think from the point of view of social proof, um, that's one of the, the bigger endorsements and validations for who you are. And I think that when you're um, when you're standing in front of people, they will always do their due diligence. Or when you meet them at a networking group or whatever, and you hand over a business card and you kind of they walk away or whatever, and they, they will immediately look you up on LinkedIn. They will look at what's, what's been going on. They will find out a bit about you. They will do all of that. So it's really important that you kind of, build and spend time developing that level of social proof particularly in today's world of visibility um jacobo you were saying what do you mean by how can you get uh referrals or referentials do you Refer mean personal ones is it referrals or is it personal ones as in linkedin or do you mean in the product linkedin um, you, there are, I think it's recommendations it's called or something. What is it called on LinkedIn? Is, um, 
It's, it's, I mean, yeah, it's recommendations and you can get them, you can go out and ask people for them. Um, and um, I would suggest that if you've done a piece of work with somebody, if you've uh, uh, attended a particular program, if you've, you know, if you've, you know, uh, I mean, we, when we've delivered the I teams in the past, um, you know, I've always said to people that participate in the I teams, if you really want, some form of you know kind of recommendation just send me a, a link and i'll i'll write something up for you and i think that, that the point is is that it doesn't hurt reaching out to people who are um on linkedin who are people you've known you've worked with or whatever and just asking for that recommendation because you just it just does bolster your kind of social credibility and it does mean that when people look into what you're doing um, they will see, you know, an endorsement, something which says that you can be trusted, that you are capable and you can be, you know, relied upon. Yeah. Okay. Um, just word of timing. So just quickly want to like last point on psychology is um, this chart I found a little bit helpful in the sense of you need to kind of, again, when you know where your customer touch points are, you need to kind of understand at what level do are they coming in? Like if they have very high skepticism at that point, you don't want to like call, like sell to them immediately. You want to engage with those doubts and you want to reduce that resistance first before you, um, you know, and, and then get them to sell themselves almost. Like you, you provide all the information that would reduce their, their kind of um, skepticism and therefore uh, become their own salesperson in themselves. Like they sell to themselves. Um, equally, for example, if you have someone who's like really like has done all the research, is, done, is ready to buy, and then you were like producing them again with lots of hurdles, um, that like things that they have to fill out or a lot of hurdles in the sense of, oh, have you read this and have you done that and are you sure and like almost hindering them to 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 kind of um, buy, it, it happens. Believe me, like it sounds so like what nobody would do that, but yeah, actually it it happens a lot like when you are ready to buy and you want to click and then it's like the link doesn't work or whatever it is like there are a lot of hindrance sometimes in the way then obviously you um yeah then that's an obstacle as well so just to be aware of those things to kind of um know where people are at and learn as much as you can about your customer it always comes back to the customers and and obviously like we said um i mean all of it this was just all of it is kind of a balance act, you know, I mean, like we said, it's not something that you look in, in, um, uh, in, se in separation or in isolation of your pricing strategy and then your sales strategy, and then I'm creating my marketing strategy. It all feeds in together, but you also want to strike a balance in terms of like how salesy you get. Um, you know, I mean, a lot of people do, for example, when they start with email marketing, which is a marketing tool to engage your customers potentially or engage leads. So people who have signed up to your newsletter, they haven't bought yet potentially, but are still engaging with your with your um, with your company. They don't want to be sales like sold to the entire time, like heart sold to. So you're basically every email you send out is just a buy, 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 or here's a discount or buy now. And, and, and that becomes like, you, you're going to lose that lead. So you want to nurture that lead with different content and then maybe have a PS, by the way, we also offer, you know, it's kind of like having a soft sale with a hard sale combined, but also with creating value and content that they like to consume that might and educate them, might give you give them something that might e might be easy to create for you in your marketing strategy. But then that that becomes your sales strategy and it's on its own as well. So, um, and always listen to you know your customers' feedback. Always keep adjusting. You know, I mean, this is an ever living process with anything in our business. <laughs> Never like always be agile and always pivot when needed to. Cool. That's it from the sales side. So now we just want to quickly again break you out into breakout rooms um, and just do a very, very quick on the same case study. So the case study is exactly the same. What we want you to kind of look at now is from those target customer segments that you looked at earlier, and you can maybe choose one or two or, you know, whichever you want to, uh, you prefer, but think about their journey. Think about the touch points that they might have 
before they actually engage and buy and, and all that. So think about the journey that they go through. And then on each of these touch points, um, you know, how could you think about ways you could capture them um, and lead them into your sales funnel kind of thing and those initial kind of strategy plans, I guess. Um, and then lastly, we, we were thinking of um, if you can create maybe what would be a sales pitch at the aware, like at two different touch points. So potentially at the awareness stage versus something where you like actually ready to purchase. So where, where like at, select two touch points that are very different or in general two touch points and then just sort of sketch up a two, like a very short, it might just be a two sentence, three sentence kind of sales pitch, but um, yeah, how, how would you word it and what kind of language would you be using? just as an, as an example and kind of as an experience. Did that make sense? Yeah, cool. I see a nod. <laughs> um, I will put you in breakout rooms now and um, we'll have, cool. Um, I'll give you again 20 minutes. I think that's plenty um, to just discuss. And then at the end, we just wrap up. We just come back, discuss quickly what your findings were and then um, we let you go. Cool. See you in 20 minutes. Um, I think those are like all of them. In uh, like I said, again, um, none of them is like, there's no right or wrong. It's kind of what you want this brand to be, what you want this experience for your customer to be. Um, but yeah, I loved all your ideas. And I think um, just from you know, not knowing anything about this business, you kind of conjure it up, you know, who this customer might be and, and things like that. So now just go home and um, if you have a business idea, obviously, well, you're, or you're already home, I guess, <laughs> just to get off the screen, I guess, and, um, and, and just sort of think about how could you apply some of those strategies or those learnings um, to your business. And, and when we talk about the confidence in ourselves, so the psychology of ourselves rather than the uh, psychology of the customer, um, take that out of the equation. Like don't put your price equal your self-worth because a lot of times, especially in personalized services, especially something like wedding photography in my case is a lot of people were doing that all the time or still doing that because um, you know they kind of like, oh no, I, I can't ask for more. Well, if you have that confidence, if you have the experience, if you know who your customer is and who, how much like disposable income they have, how much they value photography on that day, rather than, oh yeah, it's just an add-on that they want to buy. It's just a supplier. No, they rather, they, they spend, that customer might spend a lot of money because at the end of the day, the cake is eaten, the dress is in the, in the closet, but the photos are the ones that are going to stay with you forever. So that's kind of what you just as an example so your self-worth is not equal your price so just wanted to leave you with that um but yeah cool that was it for today really um can business strategies be obtained through customers point of view in business strategies do you mean like the pricing strategies um or um but yeah i mean if you take in the customer's point of view um, it's always good to take that into account. So anything that you do in terms of your business strategies, you want to take your cu uh, customers at the center of it. Um, whether that's your pro products and services that you're actually producing, um, they have to be of value. They have to be of, you know, pro solving a particular problem. Um, but it also like in your marketing, they have to be, um, yes, your products and services, absolutely. You can take your customer's point of view you want to sell like that's what we are saying with the value so you want to solve a pain point for your customers so think about your customers first um, and then think about how can you solve that pain point or that gain that they are looking to to have in their life how can you create that gain for them like what are the the things that so that's the the value proposition canvas that we often talk about so if you haven't heard of that then um have a look or get in touch with us for a one-to-one. -one. We're always here for one-to-ones as well. We can then talk about a little bit more in specific for your specific needs, but the value proposition cameras really helps you to kind of look at how can you, you look at your customer segment first and you kind of see what pain points and 
gains they have, they, they are looking for and pain points that they might experience, what frustrations they have. And then how can you solve that? That's the value that you're driving for the customer. And that's having the customers, the customer at the cent center of everything you do in your business. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, it, it's the relevance of email marketing uh, when, you're, when you're collecting emails. I just want to know when with you know, artificial intelligence and things have moved into, um, say, for example, uh, mobile applications. So how much of that is really important and effective now? So on one hand, you have the emails that is you're sending out and you're, you're marketing, you're communicating versus communicating through in-app or notifications on social media and how that has, if at all, has changed over the years. Um, I'm sure that has changed because, I mean, email marketing has been around for quite longer than I think the in-app communications. Um, but usually people use a two-tier approach so they, or like a two, um, not two-tier, but like a two-throng approach or whatever it's called because they basically do the same, like they, they communicate similar things. Um, on emails, it's really important. That's why I always um, say like use email marketing providers because you can segment the emails. So are they leads? Are they not ever purchased from you? They're just interested because of whatever they looked on your website and then like signed up for a free course or whatever it is. Are they just a lead or are they customers? So you would have different communications per, on the email side anyways for two different types of um, people. Uh, sometimes you have an overarching kind of new offer or new thing that it could be relevant to anybody um, on, your, on your email list. The in-app is obviously much more if you have, um, you know, those are your customers already potentially in your in your app, depending on whether you're going the free freemium model or not. Um, but in-app communication, they are much more direct and um, using notifications and things like that. But I think it's kind of probably looking at the data, um, like how much, what is the open rate for your emails? How can you make sure that your email list is healthy? Because open rates, if you have, it doesn't matter if you if you have twenty thousand um, people on your email list, great number. But if you if your open rates are like three percent, then that's not a very unhealthy email list. So you need to kind of always make sure that your email list is, is healthy in the sense that you need to clear out people who never open your emails. They are just they just bring down your value in that sense. But then compare that to um, app data. Um, how much are notifications, have people turned on notifications? Um, how do they see, um, you know, how do they see uh, uh, content in your app? Are they clicking on certain messages? If you have like a message section, things like that. I think, um, I'm not sure, I don't have any data in my mind at the moment that I know any kind of research that has been done in, in comparing the two. Um, it's just, I think probably people, as I can see from my own apps that I'm using, I'm on people's email lists, even though I'm also a subscriber on their app and they send me some notifications and things like that when like a new program comes out. Um, like I'm just talking about a fitness app, for example, if a new program from, a, from the same trainer comes out, then I'm like, you know, they give me a notification, but then equally I, I get also emails about it. So um, I think they use both. Did that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, yep, yeah, okay. I think uh, James was just putting something in the chat as well to just uh, reiterate that point, weren't you? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Okay, are there any other questions? Um, if not, then just wanted to quickly update you on the summer bootcamp is coming. Um, we're going to release the sign up form next week. Um, so anybody who doesn't know, the summer bootcamp is our program where you come to the bootcamp. Karina has been part of that before, um, so you know the the process. But you come to our summer bootcamp, which is on the eighth and the 9th of June. Um, and if you if you do attend, then you have the option to take part in writing a business plan over the summer with us. 
um, to then, you know, so basically we, we lay out, we, we chuck the business plan into several separate sections. And then every week or every two weeks, you have a deadline to submit your sec sections. And then we give you feet, we read it, and then we give you feedback on each section. And then you submit the next section, et cetera, et cetera. So it goes through an entire process. Um, and if you meet all the deadlines and at the end of the summer, you have a fully like a first version of your business plan. And then in October, we host the big pitch. So all people who made it from summer bootcamp attendance all the way through meeting all the deadlines for the business plan, uh, they then are invited to the big pitch where you can win up to, or you pitch against each other and you can win up to 3000 pounds. Up to, it might, we don't know yet what's what the budget situation is this year, but also it might be um, what we had in the past is that, you know, it might be one person is a winner or like one business is a winner of the 3000 pounds, or we have a split of multiple people getting like a thousand pounds, et cetera, et cetera. So it really comes down to the, um, your competitors and how good everybody is. <laughs> That's just how, how the game, the name of the game. But um, if you want to take part in the boot camp, um, we are opening the. You just have to attend the summer boot camp. So the boot camp becomes available next week. Are you guys on our mailing list? If you're not, <laughs> speaking of email marketing, um, if you're not, then uh, because we're going to announce it next week. Otherwise, just have a look on Career Hub. Uh, next week we're going to open it up, so it's going to uh, appear in the events section on there. Uh, I don't know, Madalina, are you on the um, newsletter? Yes, I'm on the newsletter. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I will. I will send you guys an email next week when we're going to open it up um, because yeah, it's few four weeks before the event happening, and um, yeah, we're super excited because every every year is always promising and it's always fun. Obviously, Karina knows that it's a lot of work, but it's also a lot of fun. Hopefully. Um, <laughs> Right, that's basically it for this mini bootcamp. So thank you so much for making it all the way through and uh, staying with us. And we hope that it was um, useful. Christian will um, send out a little feedback form. If you could fill that out for us, that would be amazing to just know what we need to change, what we need to uh, you know, improve on. We always strive to improve and change and, and all that because this is the first time we've actually ho hosted this particular um, topic. So uh, we want to bring this obviously further in uh, into our programs for next year as well. Thank you guys so much. Have a wonderful Wednesday afternoon or evening or good night, Krishna. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. Good night, Krishna. Yeah. Good night. <laughs> See you guys. Sleep well. And um, everybody else in the UK, for example, then have a good afternoon and have a good evening. Thank, See you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.